Hello and welcome to the JavaScript crash course. The goal is simple, that's to get you up to speed as quickly as possible with the JavaScript programming language to a level where you can start applying for JavaScript programming jobs. Hi, my name is Faisal and I am your instructor. Keep in mind with this course that it's pretty normal or in general when you are starting out as a programmer to be confused and occasionally frustrated. It happens. It really comes with the territory of being a programmer. So if I have one piece of advice, it would be to not to give up and to be persistent. So try and practice daily if possible, even for short sessions as short as 30 minutes or less. Right. So the next thing that I would like to talk about is have faith in the content. So if you hear me mentioning a programming term in a video, or if I appear to gloss over something, have faith that this was done for a reason and that later in the course, it will all be sort of spelt out in much more detail, explained in a lot more detail. The thing is, it's not possible to teach you absolutely everything in a single video. So we have designed the course deliberately in this fashion to put out things in the order that we think you will be able to stick to or learn JavaScript as quickly as possible. So if you stick with the course, it will all make sense. That is the bottom line. And make sure you try and enjoy the journey along the way. Now, speaking of the content, this is a crash course. So it's not a language reference guide or something that takes you through the entire JavaScript programming language. So what I mean here is that we focus on what you need to learn to become a productive and an employable JavaScript programmer. So what that means is that there are certain parts of the JavaScript language that we have omitted that in our opinion as professional developers, you don't need to know. And that's something you can always learn later. So we are focused on all the stuff, all the material that you need to know today to become employable. All right. Last thing now, be sure to watch the videos in high definition or HD quality. Obvious perhaps, but the Udemy video player does play up sometimes. So choose auto if you have that option on your video or choose 720p if you don't see the videos in all the HD glory. And lastly, if you get prompted to read the course, please do so. You can always edit your ratings later on. Ratings and reviews are very important to have for a course on Udemy. All right, so that's the housekeeping out of the way. Now let's move on and get started with the course. Hello guys, welcome to this class. So in this lecture, we are going to talk about what is JavaScript. It might seem strange to start a course on JavaScript by asking what is JavaScript? But it's an important question. Any web application has an HTML, CSS and JavaScript as the building block. Let's talk about HTML. So HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language, which is a standard markup for all modern web pages. It's a markup language that is used to define the structure of a web page. HTML can be thought as a skeleton of web page. HTML elements consist of tags that is used for rendering web pages. For example, if you have a content or a description that you want to display as a paragraph and a link, which you want to make clickable, you can use HTML to define paragraphs and links on the web page. Now, what is a CSS? So CSS stands for cascading style sheets, which is used to style web pages. Now on web pages, you might want to display a certain elements with a certain color. How would you think, how would you make that happen? 
This is where CSS comes into picture. So CSS in short is used to make web pages beautiful. Now let's talk about JavaScript. So JavaScript is a programming language for web, which is used to build interactive web pages. With JavaScript, you can define what happens when you click on a button, when you submit a form and so on. You can say that HTML defines the structure of a web page. CSS adds beauty to the web pages and JavaScript adds life or a behavior to the web pages. Also code written in JavaScript are known as scripts. Now let's take a look at this example. Now here in this particular code, the entire thing is known as an HTML element because it defines an element on a page. So P is a tag and what a wonderful web page is the content defined within the page. Now let's say if I want to add some styling to this element. So I will say this CSS, which specifies that p tag should apply blue color in it. Now p is a selector over here and color is a property and blue is a value. So p is a selector, color is a property and blue is a value. Now let me give you an example. So I will navigate to my web browser to show something to you. So here on the web browser, I am on learnprogramming.academy. Now I'll right click on this, become the programmer that gets you the job offer. So I'll right click and I'll say inspect. Now you can see this particular line is written. So basically this has this particular content here, become the programmer that gets you the job offer. This is written within the H2 tag, as you can see over here. And the CSS for this element over here is shown here at the bottom. So you can see element dot style over here, and it has the color, font size, font weight, and font style. And all these are applied. So if I uncheck any of this, so if I uncheck color, you can see the color changes. And if I select it again, it will apply the color. So this is CSS in action. And this is the HTML part that you are seeing. Now with Chrome, you can right click and go to inspect and check out any element on the web page. Okay. So I'm using Chrome browser. So you can even try this out in some other browser that you are using, but I will be sticking to Chrome for this course. Now here we are seeing JavaScript being executed in the browser. Now how is browser able to execute the JavaScript code? So browsers have a JavaScript engine, which is embedded in the browser. So Chrome has a V8 engine, which is also found in other browsers like Opera and Edge. Firefox, which is another popular browser out there has spider monkey engine, which is used to execute the JavaScript code. So I have one more link open here in this browser, which is for the V8 JavaScript engine. So I'll add the link to these articles in the resource section of this course. But what I mean to say over here is this is the article a Wikipedia article on the V8 JavaScript engine and you can read more about this engine. There's another link, which is for the spider monkey engine. Okay. So these are the two URLs that you can go to and read more about the JavaScript engines, if you wish to. Now, the JavaScript code that is executed in the browser is because of this engine. And because of this engine, the JavaScript code can execute anywhere on the server, wherever this engine is. And this makes JavaScript really, really powerful. So I'll head over to my PPT now. 
So let's talk about what can you do with JavaScript. So with JavaScript, you can add interactions in your web page, which can improve the user experience. For example, you can show a message on the click of a button. You can add animations. You can display timers like a countdown and so on. JavaScript today can be used to write server-side web applications and even build web servers. And this is possible with the help of Node.js, which is nothing but a JavaScript runtime environment, which is used to execute JavaScript code outside of a web browser. JavaScript can also be used to build mobile applications which run on different mobile devices. You can even use JavaScript to build interactive games. Now that's about JavaScript so far. And before closing in, I would like to mention a stat. So as of 2022, 98% of the websites use JavaScript as per Wikipedia. And this is an amazing stat and it tells you how important JavaScript is in web development. So that's about this class, guys. I hope you guys had fun knowing what is JavaScript and I'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome to this class. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss how can you make JavaScript work in your web browser? So let's get started. So here I am on my Google Chrome browser. So you can either open Google Chrome or a Firefox and you can right click and you can say inspect over here. So I'll select inspect and you will see this window pop up. Now here, you have elements that is by default selected here at the top. So I'll switch over to console. Now, once I switch over to console here on this console, we can execute our JavaScript statements. So let's print our first hello world message on the console. What I will be doing is I'll just zoom in a bit so that it's clear to you. And I hope you guys can see the console over here. So here in the console, I'll say console dot log. Okay. I'll just expand this a bit. All right. So we, I have console dot log and a open bracket and I'll say, I'll add a single inverted comma and I'll say, hello world okay and i'll add a semicolon now i'll press enter so you can see hello world being printed on the console so what we have done here is we have executed a javascript statement which is printing hello world in the browser console now how did we make this happen so for this we used a function which is console.log. So this is a function in JavaScript using which you can print anything to the console. And as you can see here, we have passed a string element as an argument. So this is a string which we have passed to this function. And whatever we pass over here is being printed as is on the console. Now, I would like to mention a couple of things over here. So using this function, you can pass any string and that string will get printed here. Also, here we have added a string in the single inverted commas. So you can even use double inverted commas to do so. So let me show that to you. So I'll say console dot log. I'll add a double inverted comma this time. Okay, and I'll say, so I'll add, I love JavaScript and I'll press enter. 
So you will see I love JavaScript being printed on the console and you have this now printed with the help of double inverted commas and the console.log function. Now, like you can print, I love JavaScript and hello world, you can even perform calculations on the console. So you can say three plus two directly and you can see a preview of the output here already, which is five without even pressing enter. So if I backspace, the preview goes away. And if I like type the digit again, you will see the preview. And if I press enter, you will see it being printed. So you can perform calculations also like this on the JavaScript console. So I can say 10 plus 20, which is nothing but 30 and so on. So what I mean to say here is you can use this as a calculator as well. And moreover, you must have seen alert boxes or pop-up boxes when using web applications. So you can even create your own alert box right from this console. So let me show that to you as well. So in the console, I can say alert, so alert, and I'll pass in the message. So I'll say, hello world, and I'll press enter. So you can see hello world being displayed in the browser here. Now, one thing that I would like to highlight over here is we have seen how you can write strings using a single inverted comma or a double inverted comma. You can use any of these. Okay. There is no right or wrong here, but in JavaScript world, it's more common to use a single inverted commas. So if you're referring to any examples online, you will see single inverted commas being used more frequently, which is fine. Okay, you can even use double inverted commas if you wish to. But this is something that I wish to highlight. So here we are now displaying an alert box. Okay, we can even, so if you want to run the previous command, you can just press up arrow on the console, on your keyboard, not console, and you can press enter again, and you will see the old command being executed. So this is how you can execute and run some simple JavaScript statements in the browser without an IDE. However, to write a full fledged JavaScript applications, you will need to have a development environment. All right. And let's talk about that in our next video. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class. I'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this video, we are going to look at the basic tools we are going to need to begin programming in JavaScript. So we'll need a browser to execute JavaScript code and Google Chrome is what I will be using in this course. We will also need some way of creating our code. And all you really need is a simple text editor but it's more productive to use an integrated development environment or an IDE. Now there are some benefits of using an IDE over a normal text editor. And the benefits are you get access to features like easy source code highlighting, autocomplete, debugging and more. Now I'm going to assume you don't already have a development environment set up. If you do already have an IDE set up on your computer and it can be used to write JavaScript and if you are comfortable with it, then you can continue using that for this course. But we are going to use Visual Studio Code for this course. But as I said, you can use something else if you prefer. So Visual Studio Code is an IDE and I'm going to search for Visual Studio Code on Google. So the moment you search for Visual Studio Code, you will see this first link coming up over here, which takes you to link code.visualstudio.com. So either you can type in this URL directly in the browser or 
you can just google and land on this url now here this is the landing page of this particular ide and you can see different features if you scroll down here so you can see different features like intellisense so it goes beyond syntax highlighting and it provides smart completions based on variable types and so on so a lot of features you can see it's integrated with a version control system like git so it's customizable okay and it can be used to program in various languages so you can use for writing python code as you can see here you it can be used with docker so so different technologies it works with okay and it also allows you to deploy okay so you can read more over here and you you can see like visual studio code can be used for javascript python java and so on so we'll be using it for javascript and you have the download links for the install of your choice so either you can download from here okay or you can scroll up here you can see the button over here which tells download for windows so it has recognized that i have windows and i'm accessing this site from a windows machine and hence it's telling me download for windows but if you try accessing this website from a mac machine or equivalent like a linux or something so you will see this button changing accordingly so i'll say download for windows okay and i'll just click on this button here and the moment you download you will see the download has begun here in the progress bar at the top right and here you are being redirected to the documentation for windows and you can see visual studio code has a concept of extensions as well so you can add extensions to your ide and work with different features so it just adds more features or you can say extensions are plugins which when installed it will add a few features and it will make your id more powerful so the download is done okay and i'll just go to my downloads folder so i'll say i'll go here and i'll go to the downloads folder and this is the setup so i'll just double click on the installer here okay and i'll close this so the moment you double click you will see this pop up okay so if you are on mac you will have to double click on the dmg file and follow the instructions for the installation but since i am on windows i got a dot exe file and on double clicking i see this window here so this is the license agreement which i should accept you can read it if you wish to but i'll just accept and i'll move forward now it's telling me the link or the location where this software will be installed so if i'm fine with the default i can click next or else i can choose browse i go next and it's telling me that it will create the following shortcut in the start menu folder so i'm fine with this as well i'll say next and i'll leave these to default as well i can choose to create a desktop icon but i don't want to so i'll say next again and it's giving me a summary now with an install button so i'll just click install and the installation has begun so this will take a couple of minutes and once this progress bar is 100% you will see the installation complete so you'll see if you click finish and if launch visual studio code is selected clicking finish will launch the ide so once the installation is successful this is what you will see okay and this is a page which is the getting started page of visual studio code and this tells us that our installation has been successful you can additionally check out the link to documentations here on the right hand side okay if you are curious about this ide and wish to learn more so that's about this class guys i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable 
I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome to this class. So in this lecture, we are going to start writing our first JavaScript program. So we have already installed the Visual Studio code here. And Visual Studio code has folders which are workspaces. So it has the concept of workspaces and we are going to be creating files where our source code will reside. If you have decided not to install and use Visual Studio Code, perhaps because you are already using an IDE that you prefer, then obviously these steps I am going to show you in this video will be different. But the concepts of creating a JavaScript program will be the same. But on Visual Studio Code, to get everything set up correctly, we are going to start off by creating a new folder at our desired location. So the desired location for me will be desktop. So on the desktop right now over here, I'll say right click and I'll create a new folder here and I'll call this folder as JavaScript. So this is the folder where our source code will reside. Now these steps that I'm showing you are going to be same on all operating systems, Windows, Mac and Linux. My setup for recording these videos is on a Windows machine. So that's what I'm generally gonna be using in the course. But you will find that whether you are using Windows, Mac or Linux, the steps are pretty much the same. All right, so next you will go to Visual Studio Code and open this folder in Visual Studio Code. So what I will do is I will open up the IDE. I'll say open folder and I'll go to desktop and I'll select the folder that we have just created and I'll say select folder. Now depending on whether you are running on Windows, Mac or Linux, obviously the project location will be different. So you will have to navigate accordingly. And we don't need to install any other additional software other than the IDE because we are just using a browser here to execute the JavaScript code. So you might see this pop up. Do you trust the authors of the files in this folder? Okay, so I'll say I trust. Okay, trust the authors of all the files in the parent folder desktop and I'll say trust and enable all features. All right, I'll close this getting started page. Now what we will be doing is we will be creating a new file index.html. So I'll first create a new folder here. I'll call it first program. Okay. And I'll create an index.html underneath this folder. So I'll say index.html here. Okay. So you can see the file opening up in the editor on the right hand side. Now we are creating an HTML file because we will be executing our JavaScript file in the browser for which we need an HTML file where our script or JavaScript code would reside. Now Visual Studio Code has good support for HTML and it helps us generate some boilerplate code too. So for that, I will press an exclamation. So after pressing the exclamation, I'll just type enter and you will see some code being auto generated. And you can see that there are some HTML tags. Okay. So you can see there is a head tag and this tag defines the metadata of the HTML page. So you can see this is the metadata along with the title tag, which defines the title for our HTML page. Now we will update this title to JavaScript crash course. So I'll say JavaScript crash course and under the body tag. Okay. I'll say H1 tag here and I'll type in hello. JavaScript. So now what I will be doing is I will be adding a script tag just below 
the body element so here we are closing the body element okay on line 11 we are closing it so i'll add the script tag over here just below the body so i'll say script and i'll press enter and now here i will start typing in the same code that we had written in the browser okay so you can just switch to the browser if you have it open so here i had said console.log hello world and i'll just copy this select copy and you can either type it over here or you can just paste it all right and i'll save it now what i will do is i will open up this file index.html in the browser and we will see this output wherein this script is being executed so i'll head over to my desktop javascript and i'll open up the index.html okay so i'll just double click on index.html and you will see it being opening in the browser you can see the title javascript crash course and hello javascript being printed but we are not seeing the hello world message being printed which we have written in console.log so for that you will have to right click say inspect and you will have to go to console so i'll just zoom in a bit so that you have a better view so here you can see hello world being printed so you have to navigate to console tab here and you will see the output coming over here. And this is coming from index.html line number 13, as you can see. Okay. Now, if I just minimize this a bit, okay. And you can see line number 13 talks about console.log. So this is what we are printing on the browser. So we have got hello world confirmed as running on the screen. And as you can see where that hello world came from, it's what we typed in the single quotes on line number 13. All right. Now a semicolon here denotes the end of the line. So make sure you're typed the code exactly as you see it over here. If for example, you use the uppercase C for console. So here I am, I've typed it in all lowercase. So if I make this uppercase and if I save this and in browser, if I refresh, you will see uncaught reference error. Console is not defined. All right. And you will see the error in red. So type it exactly as you see it. And by doing that, we have made the changes disappear. So we'll just revert this and I'll just refresh. So you will see the error is gone now. All right. So that's our brief start. And we have now created our first JavaScript program in Visual Studio Code. And we have also seen this program running in our web browser. So that's about this class guys. In this lecture, we learned how can you create your first JavaScript program and also run it in the browser. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome to this class. So in this lecture, we are going to talk about the structure of a JavaScript code. And by the end of this lecture, you are going to have a complete understanding of the st overall structure of a JavaScript program. So let's get started. So I'll head over to my Visual Studio code here. And we are going to first take a look at the boilerplate code that Visual Studio Code generated for us in one of the last videos. We are going to start looking at what it means. If you haven't already got the code open, start Visual Studio Code and open this file index.html. So we have index.html file, which is 
a file of HTML type and our source code, including the HTML and the JavaScript code resides in this file. The JavaScript code looks very simple, just one line. HTML code consists of tags and elements and JavaScript code consists of statements, which is essentially an instruction that you wish to give to execute. Right now in our code, we have only one JavaScript statement, which instructs to print hello world. When you run the code in browser, the JavaScript engine does the job of executing these statements. So here we start with the HTML tag here. Okay. And this is the entire file. So within the HTML tag, we have all the code here and then we have the head tag and the body tag and the script tag. So head tag means the header tag, which has some of the meta tags here, and it defines the meta for this particular web page. And then we have the title tag, which describes the title that we will have. So you can see the title that is being reflected here is coming from this title tag. So you can keep title, whatever you wish to. Then we close our head tag. We then have the body tag wherein we define what comes on the HTML page. And here we are defining hello JavaScript. And that is what is being printed on the page here. Hello JavaScript. You can change this to whatever you want. And since we are displaying this in the H1 tag, it is being displayed in larger fonts here. So if I just collapse this, you'll see it's in a larger font, which means it is being populated from the H1 tag. So we don't have much in the body tag, but you can add multiple elements here. If you wish to, we just close our body tag. Then we have the script tag, wherein we define the JavaScript. And here within the script tag, we have written our JavaScript code. Now JavaScript code is always written within the script tag and this tag can be added anywhere in the web page. Now we are adding it to the end of the web page and there's a good reason for that. So the first reason is to avoid unknown errors. So like, you know, JavaScript adds behavior to the web pages, which means it works with the elements defined on the HTML page. Now there's a possibility that JavaScript might even try to alter the elements on the web page, depending on the state. Now, if you add JavaScript at the top, so this is right now after the body tag. So if you add them in the head tag, for example, or at the top, then there is a possibility that JavaScript code might try to access the HTML elements and HTML elements might not have loaded yet. And this could lead to potential unexpected errors and your application might not work properly. So this is the first reason. The second reason is to speed up the website. If you have added JavaScript at the top of the web page, and there is a lot of script that is written, then the script might take a while to load. HTML elements will load only once the script has loaded fully, which might lead to slow response time on the web page. This won't be good from the user experience standpoint and hence, it's always a good practice to load JavaScript at the end of the page so that these issues that we discussed can be avoided. Now within the script tag, you can see a single JavaScript statement. So you can even have multiple JavaScript statements here. So I can just duplicate this line here. I can just copy paste it here. I can hit save. I'll navigate to browser and hit refresh. 
So you can see hello world being printed twice. So you can definitely have multiple statements in the script tag. Now, another thing that I wish to highlight is JavaScript does not care about the indentation. So if you are coming from a programming background like Python, you will know that indentation is important in those programming languages. However, JavaScript uses curly braces to group statements together. And this is something that you will see later in the course. So if I change the indentation here and if I hit save and if I refresh, you will see the same output. All right. So I'll just press control Z and I'll save the file. Okay. So that's the basic structure of the JavaScript program. There is still a lot to explain, which we will see in the later videos. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys. Welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to talk about how can you do more with your development environment? So far we have written a couple of statements in JavaScript and we are seeing the output in the browser. So right now, if I make any change, so let's say if I add a full stop over here, I hit save and then I have to go to the browser. The changes are not reflected here. And to reflect the change, I have to hit refresh. So you can see the changes are reflected now. So you will have to do a refresh every time you make any small change in your JavaScript code. So this is not hundred percent efficient and there's a better way. So what I would want to show you is if you make any change in the JavaScript file, the output will be reflected instantly without any refresh. And for making that happen, we will have to install a small extension in our visual studio code. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to visual studio code and I'm going to click on this extensions icon over here. So I'll say here extensions and I'll scroll down a bit. So this extension that I'm looking for is not installed for me. So what I will do is I'll search for live server. So if you just type live, you will see this first extension called live server. Okay. So if you click on this, so this is a small lightweight server that you can add to your visual studio code. Okay. So what it does is it starts a local development server with live reload feature. So every time you make a change, the page is refreshed instantly when you hit save and you can see the changes instantly. So this makes your workflow much more efficient and you will see the output very easily and quickly. So what I will do is I will go ahead and click on install. So it's installing. It will take some time. So the installation is done. I'll hit close. I'll close this and I'll go to the code here. So now we have live server installed. Now, how do we run this code on live server? So to do that, I'll have to right click on this file and you will see a new option come up over here. Open with live server. So I'll click on this. And the moment I say open with live server, you will see a browser window opening up and you will see the URL of localhost along with a port number. Okay. And you have the folder structure and the index.html. All right. So since this is a new browser window, I'll just cut this and I'll close this. And I'll go to my older window and I'll paste it over here. Okay. So this is now running on this server. Okay. So what I will do is I'll just minimize this. 
okay and so i have aligned it side by side here and i'll open the console now okay so here is the console okay you can see the message live reload enabled now whenever i make any change to the source code so if i let's say remove the full stop and if i hit save you will see the changes being reflected instantly okay i can say hello javascript here and i can hit save and you will see the output instantly so this is magic okay <laughs> like for like at least if you're making and if you're doing some live development out there and if you're continuously making some changes to the file i think this is really helpful rather than refreshing it every time so i have this another tab open wherein we had opened the file manually via the browser you can see see in the address bar and you will notice that it's not running on the server so i'll have to refresh over here to see the output so every time you make a change you hit refresh but this is much more better all right so this is a small customization that i wish to show you uh, actually it's not a customization we have just added an extension and we have like executed the code on the server all right so that's about this class guys i hope you guys understood how you can configure live server for yourself on your local machine so that's about this class guys i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome to this class so in this lecture we are going to talk about how can you separate the javascript file so by the end of this lecture you will have a complete clarity as to why you should separate your javascript code from the html and how can you do it so right now we have a simple javascript and html file but the code that we have written is very very simple it's pure basic and in real world applications your code base will be much more larger and there will be lots of javascript code that you will have so it's not feasible or it's not advisable to have your javascript code in the html file and that is for the following reasons so the number one reason is it would make the html file difficult to manage and number two it would make hard to spot errors since it's a very very long file and number three it will even make your code look very overwhelming to anyone reading it so because of these reasons it is highly recommended to have a separate file for your javascript code but the question is how can you separate javascript from html so to do that what i will do is i will first create a javascript file so i'll say main.js okay and i will copy the javascript code that we have written here i'll just cut it and i'll paste it over here all right so i will keep the script tags as it is and i'll add an src attribute here okay and i'll add the name of the javascript file that we have just created so i'm just adding the name here because the javascript file exists in the same folder as that of the index.html so that is why i have just added the name here but if it's in some other folder i will have to add the complete path over here so i'll just hit save here and the moment i hit save you will see the output is as it is it's not changed and if i add a full stop here okay and if i hit save you can see it being reflected over here so what we have done is we have separated the javascript code 
from our HTML file. And we have done it with the help of the script tag. And within the script tag, we have added the SRC attribute, which links the HTML file to the JavaScript file. So that's about this class guys. In this lecture, we learned how can you separate the JavaScript file or JavaScript code from the HTML file. And we also learned why you should do that. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to talk a bit about dot notation and how can we use methods from other classes. So what we are going to do is we are going to create a new project, which will be a simple version of Eliza. Eliza, in case if you haven't come across it before, was a program written in 1960s. It is an interesting program for a couple of reasons. It was the first program to attempt natural language processing and gave the illusion of understanding what the user was typing. It doesn't understand that just an illusion as you will see when we examine the code. The other reason it's interesting is because it completely failed at the purpose it was written for. Joseph Weizenbaum wrote Eliza to demonstrate that communication between a human and a computer was superficial. He was surprised by the results with the users believing that the program did understand what they were typing. We have created a simple version of Eliza program and the code is really very short. However, there are quite a few lines of data and I'm sure you don't want to type it all in. Instead, what you can do is you can download the zip file from the resources for this video and it will have all the resources like images and HTML, CSS and JavaScript files to make Eliza work. So what we will do is I will head over to my IDE here IntelliJ. I'll open up the project explorer. I'll collapse this and I'll click over here and I'll create a new folder. I'll call this folder as Eliza. So what we are going to do is every program that we write or every project that we create, I'm going to create folders for them. So this is the Eliza folder, which will have all the source file for the Eliza project. Now, what I will do is I'll open up a folder on my local machine. So this is a folder that you should be able to find in the resources section of this video. You can download the zip file and extract it to get all of these files. So I'll just copy these files and I'll paste it over here. Okay, so the copy doesn't work. So if it doesn't, you can simply drag drop and it will just show up over here. So I won't go through all these files at the moment. It uses a lot of things that we haven't talked about yet. And we'll be covering all that throughout the course. So we've added two files right now that contains the JavaScript code. So I'll close this index.html. So you can see doctor.js and main.js. So I'll open up main.js. Now here, if you take a look at the top, you will see some constants defined, okay? Then you have Eliza created over here. And here you have a function which is triggered when the page is loaded. So when the window on load event is triggered, what you do is you create an object of Eliza and you call the set intro function. Now what is set intro function? So set intro function is a function defined here that will print 
the intro message for the user. Then you have the send message function, which generates the bot response. So you have a welcome message, the user is welcomed, then user types in something, and then you have the bot message that is being generated, which is nothing but the response to what user has typed in. And then you have append message function here, which is written. And this function forms the HTML using string interpolation and appends it to the interface. And if you scroll down, you have bot response method, which generates the bot response that needs to be shown to the user. So if you scroll down further, you will see a couple of more functions defined, like you will have get function and the format date function. So get function is used to get the element from the document object and format date returns the date in a particular format that needs to be displayed. So don't worry if this all looks confusing, we'll go through like each of the concept throughout this course. So when the page loads, we are creating an instance of the Eliza class over here. So the definition of the Eliza class is in doctor.js. And that is where this class is coming from. Now this class will have the methods defined. And if we have to access these methods, which are defined within this class, we will have to use the dot notation. So Eliza class has a method called intro. So if you open doctor.js and if you scroll down, you will see our intro method that is defined within the Eliza class. And you can see it is generating a response, which is a bot response. And this response is formed as a string and it returns the string as the response. Now to use the method of the class, we have to use the dot notation. And what it means is the method is separated from the class name by the object. And that way, JavaScript knows that the intro is the method that's defined in the doctor class. So I'll head over to main.js and you will see we first create the object of Eliza. Now, if you wish to see where all like we are using this particular object, Eliza, you can just double click on this and it will highlight where all you are using this particular word in the entire file. So you can see that it's being used here. So Eliza.intro over here. So this is something that is coming from Eliza class. If you scroll down to here, you can see make response over here. Okay. And here we are generating the response and returning to the function. Okay. So we are using Eliza object at couple of places in this particular source code. All right. And you can see we are using it to print the intro and also to get the response. Fine. So now what we can do is what I will do. I will right click on eliza.html and I'll open this file with a live server. Okay, so it triggered the new instance of the browser. So I'll just cut this and I'll paste it over here. Okay, so I have the Eliza code running in the browser and you can see the intro message here from Eliza. So it says, I'm Eliza, talk to the program in plain English enter quit when done. And it's also asking the question, hello, how are you feeling today? So I can say I'm feeling good. And I'll press send. Now, the moment I press send, it's asking me how long have you been feeling good? So the program is talking to me. And I can say since very long. I'll press send. How do you feel when you say that? So it will keep on asking you questions and it will talk to you. So this is a program. You can just play around with it. 
The program is far from perfect and it wouldn't take long for most people to work out that they are talking to a computer. The original program had far more responses programmed into it, but this is basically how it worked. So it's quite impressive for such a short program and you can spend a few minutes having a conversation with it. Nowadays, we have several examples of true artificial intelligence, things like Apple's Siri program, Microsoft Cortana and Google Assistant all understand the input they are given to some extent anyway. This program has no understanding. It's just matching words and producing a randomized response. So that's about this class guys. So I hope you guys have a fair clarity on what is dot notation and how can you make it work. So we saw the main.js file of Eliza program. We saw Eliza program in action and we saw how dot notation is being used in Eliza. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to take a look at the structure of the JavaScript program in a bit more detail. So we'll be using the Eliza project from the last video and we'll examine the code in more detail. So we'll start by opening the Eliza project. If you don't have it open, please open it and I'll open the doctor.js file. Now here at the top of the file, you have constant statements. So what are statements? So a statement is nothing but an instruction that is to be executed. We have some lists defined to make Eliza work. And one of this is called matches, which is defined over here. And we are going to use that to hold the list of the text that Eliza recognizes. And we'll be looking at these collection classes in a far more detail later on. So I'll just expand this view. Okay. And every statement that you see in JavaScript will end with a semicolon, as you can see over here. You won't get an error if you don't use semicolon, but it's always best to follow the convention. After these JavaScript statements, wherein we declare a some constants, we have a comment. So here, if you scroll down, we have a comment here. Now everything from here, which starts with a forward slash and asterisk on line number 128 to line number 131 is a comment. So this entire thing is a comment. Now, what is a comment? So comment is ignored by JavaScript and has no effect on your code. Basically it is not executed. You can have a comment that gives a brief description of the code as to what it does and also contains an acknowledgement to the authors of the original code. Now, if you move down the line, you will see a variable that is defined which is called random. Now JavaScript includes a random method that we can use to generate random numbers. So we are creating this variable to store a random number. Now, why would we want to do that? Well, have a look at the last response list over here. So this last response list. So basically this list name is responses and the last response list, if you take a look at, it contains of 10 strings. So if you scroll to the right, you will see 10 strings that have been added over here. Okay. So 10 strings here. Now, why have we added 10 strings? So these 10 strings are for Eliza's responses to one of the matching inputs. And if she always replied with the first response, please tell me more we would soon get bored with her. Instead, the program selects one of those 10 responses at random. All right. 
So that is why we are generating a random number here. So then we have the Eliza class, okay? So what I will do is I will rename Eliza class and I'll rename it to doctor, okay? And I'll hit save. And the moment I do this, I'll have to make the changes in the main.js, okay? So here, I'll scroll up and I'll say doctor. And I'll hit save, okay? Now let me test the change after running this, okay? So I'll just open it in this instance here, okay? And I say, hi, Eliza feeling good and I say send and I'm glad you could drop by today do you think is it so it's working perfectly fine and there are no issues as such okay so we changed the name of the Eliza class to that of doctor okay and here we have the doctor class and most of the file is taken up by this doctor class here. And just before the class definition, like we saw, we got the list of recognized words or phrases. And we also saw the dictionary of reflections. So if you scroll up, you will have the dictionary of reflections. So this is the dictionary of reflections and we have the responses, okay? So we have matches, then we have reflections, and then we have responses. And you will see how these are used as we work through the code, okay? So I'll scroll down here. Now, here, just within the doctor class, you will see there's an intro method. And intro method returns the string that the user first see when, the, when they run the program. So here, that you see intro, so here is the intro that you see, and you can see that is what is being returned from here, okay? And the main work of the Eliza class is performed by this make response method here, which starts on line 145. And this method contains quite a few comments that you are seeing being highlighted in green, and these are single line comments. So if you scroll up here, forward slash, asterisk, and asterisk, backward slash. This was multi-line comment. So everything within these symbol will be considered as comment and won't be executed. However, if you want to comment a single line, you can use two times forward slash. So this is a single line and multi-line comment. And like multi-line comment that we saw at the start of the file, these single line comments are also ignored by the JavaScript. And they are there for us humans to read, to help us understand the code better. Now, when you were looking at the responses in the list, okay, so if you scroll up here, you will see some symbols like percentage one, okay? And if you scroll to the right, let me scroll to the right a bit you will see percentage one here. Like what is percentage one? And you will think that it does not make sense. And you might wonder why some of them have percentage one. But if you scroll down, so let me scroll down a bit. And in the responses list, the comment here explains why we used percentage one. So what we do is percentage one is replaced by something, okay? So that is how, what Eliza does is, so like you can see over here, do you think, so I have entered it is. So do you think percentage one was replaced by it is? Okay, so that is how it works. So percentage one will always be replaced by something over here on line number 188, which I have selected. Okay, so the major work, like I said, is done by make response method, wherein all the matching and uh, forming of responses is done and that output is returned and shown to the user. So I'm going to stop here because by now you are probably thoroughly confused 
and that's good confusion is the natural state of a programmer when you are learning to program you will spend most of your time confused and that's pretty normal students often become discouraged because nothing seems to make sense what i can promise you that it will all make sense but it doesn't happen overnight prepare to be confused for weeks or months heck i have been doing this for years and i'm still confused a lot of the time in the rest of this course we are going to go through all the keywords that are used in this code and more will explain what they are and how to use them you will understand what things are like that for loop that you see over here okay you will also be able to improve the program because it does have some problem okay so what I, we will do is we will move on from this project for now okay and we'll head over to the next lecture Okay, so that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome to this class. So in this lecture, we are going to do a section summary of what we have learned throughout this section. So in this section, we have looked at what JavaScript is and how can we run JavaScript in browsers. We have downloaded and installed the tools we need and created our first JavaScript project, Hello World. We then had a look at the structure of a JavaScript program. We looked at code blocks which are enclosed in the curly braces. We saw that our code is written inside the methods and methods appear inside a class. Of course, you can even have functions outside the class as well, which we will even take a look at in the latest parts of this course. We learned about dot notation and understood how methods from classes are referred to using the dot notation syntax. So there's a still lot to learn and you probably won't understand the most of the code in the doctor class. Don't worry, we'll be covering it all. And by the end of this course, you will understand what all that code is doing and even more. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this section and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome to this class. So in this lecture, we are going to do a section introduction. So in the previous section, we had a brief look at the JavaScript language and wrote a bit of code to make our ELISA program work. In this section, we are going to look at the language in more detail. We'll start by discussing variables and different types of variables we can use. JavaScript is a untyped language and we will see what that means and why it's important. We will then review the most commonly used types in JavaScript and see how to choose the most appropriate type for each situation so that you can see code being used in realistic context, we have created a couple of programs that we will be using throughout the course. You have already seen the ELIZA program. We have also got a business type of game based on Hammurabi. Hammurabi is a very early game that eventually led to more modern city building games such as SimCity. We will be using those programs to show how things fit into real world program rather than just showing you snippets of code in isolation. You will also create some small fun programs as you work through the course. So there's a lot to learn. Let's get started with this section.
Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss variables and expressions in JavaScript. So by the end of this lecture, you will have a complete clarity as to how you can use variables and how you can create them in your JavaScript program. So let's get started. So to begin with, I will start by creating a new folder over here in the Visual Studio code. So I'll just collapse all of this and I'll create a new folder. So either I can create a new folder or I have written this first program over here. So I can even duplicate this to save the typing efforts. So I have first program, I'll say rename and I'll call this as variables. All right. And now within this file here, like I can keep everything same. Okay. So it says hello JavaScript, JavaScript crash course, and it links to main.js in the same folder, which we have over here. All right. So I'll close all. I'll just have this JavaScript file open here. And I also need to put this file on the server. So I'll say open with live server. I'll copy the URL. So it opened in a new instance of the browser. So instead I'll just copy the URL and I'll paste it over here. All right. So I have this file open here and I'll start deleting the code. Okay. We are going to start fresh over here. All right. So one thing that you should understand before we start talking about variables is JavaScript is an untyped language, which means that variables created in JavaScript can hold the value of any data type. This means that before we assign a value to a variable in JavaScript, we do not have to declare it. If you are coming from a programming background like C sharp or Java, you will know that there you have to declare the variable before you start to use it. In JavaScript, the type of value that is being assigned to the variable can change on the fly and it's taken care of. Declaring a variable just means telling what its name is and what type of data it can store. With JavaScript, you can declare the variable using the let keyword. So you have to specify let space and the name of the variable. So let's see some examples so you should have this main.js open in the editor and you can just start typing in some code. So I'm going to say let first number. Okay. So this is my first variable. And one thing that you should know is you can even assign a value to a variable. So here I have just declared it as of now. So you can assign the value to the variable by using the equal operator. Okay. And you can, so I, I'll just assign this as two. Okay. And I'll even create one more variable here. So I'll say let second number is equal to five. All right. So these are two variables that I have created. The number one variable is first number, which has the value of two. Then we have second number, which has the value of five. Now we have assigned some values to this variables while declaring it. And we will be using these variables in a simple guess the number game. And our variables are storing whole numbers here. So two and five are whole numbers, which means we use the number type over here. We will be looking at more types later. In this video, we will stick to number and string. 
Now here you have already noticed that we are using the let keyword, but no data type. So you have let here and let here, but there is no data type. We have named our variable and you can call your variable what you want, but there are some rules. It also makes sense to give them names that reflect what they mean. With a few exceptions, avoid using single character names like A, B or X and Y. Okay, but what are the rules? So variable names in JavaScript can start with letter, digits, dollar or an underscore. They can contain numbers, but the name must not start with a number. For example, I'll just create a variable name. I'll say let and I'll say first number is equal to two. All right. So this will give me an error. It's showing me red highlight and Visual Studio Code checks our code as we type it, which is very handy. Because I've started the variable name with digit, Visual Studio Code is highlighting the code in red and it's underlining it with red color. You can find out what the problem is by moving the cursor or hovering it onto the top of the variable here and you will see the message pop up appear. The message don't always mean much when you are starting to learn all this, but at least you can see that there is an error. Now I'll just undo this change and I'll just remove this to fix it. Okay. And you can see the error is gone. Now we can even print the value on the console. So I'll say enter, I'll say console dot log and I'll say first number and I'll end it with a semicolon. And the moment I save, you will see two being printed on the right hand side. So after the variable name, you can put an optional assignment like this. It's a good idea to give your variables a value when you declare them. Sometimes if that's not possible, you may be calculating the value in your code. So you don't know what it is when you declare the variable. As long as the variable gets a value before you try to use it, that's fine. All right, so back to the rules. Variables must not have the same name as the JavaScript keyword. Now keywords are things like class, which we have got in JavaScript. So let me create a variable here. So I'll say let class is equal to eight. And I'll end this with a semicolon. Now you will see that you are getting an error over here. Okay. So this is because class is a predefined keyword in JavaScript. Now you may think that you may have to remember every single JavaScript keyword so that you don't use them as variable names. So you could do that, but it sounds like hard work. Instead, just make a note of this error. So the error is not clear as of now, but as and when you program, you will have or you will remember the names of commonly used JavaScript keywords and you will get a hang of it. So like practicing is the only solution over here. It's not possible to remember all the keywords in JavaScript or in any programming language. Now I'll delete this line and let me add one more variable. So this time I'll declare it using where. So I'll say subtraction and I'll say seven over here and I'll end it with a semicolon. Okay. So this time I have declared it differently. I have used where instead of let and it does exactly the same thing as the previous two declarations. 
but then what is the difference why do we have let and where so there are some differences in the usage of where versus let but i'll mention that where is an old way of declaring variables in javascript all modern scripts use let to declare variables both ways of doing it will work but it's highly recommended that you use let which is the new way so i'll change this to let okay now we have got three variables declared i'll even delete this line okay so we have three variables 2 5 and 7 respectively now our game is going to be very simple i'll ask the player to choose a number from 1 to 10 and then ask them to do some sums with their number by sums i mean additions with their number when they have done all that the computer will tell them what the answer is so we are going to need another variable to hold the answer so i'll declare that next and i'll say let answer okay now i haven't assigned a value to answer because we haven't calculated it yet and that's fine you don't have to assign a value at the same time as declaring the variable you won't get an error here because it's fine to have a variable declared in javascript without assigning it a value the value right now it's going to hold is undefined so i can show that to you i can in fact type in here console dot log and if we type in answer okay and if i save you will see undefined being printed here so answer is not defined yet all right so that's about this class guys i hope you guys have a fair clarity of variables how you can create variables assign values and even we saw the rules like some of the rules that you need to keep in mind when creating or declaring variables so i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to talk about dynamic typing in javascript and by the end of this lecture we will have a complete clarity as to what dynamic typing means and how does it work in javascript so javascript has dynamic typing now what is dynamic typing as you can see over here we have created a few variables but one thing that is different with javascript is it does not have the type declaration so we have not specified whether the type of this variable is a number or a string or what it is so the type of the variable is not given at the time of declaration or creation then the question is how and when is the type of a variable defined and decided now the answer to this is it is decided based on what value you are storing in the variable so you have this variable here and if you are assigning it a whole number the type is a number if you are assigning it a string the type is a string in that case now since javascript is a dynamically typed language what it means is the type of the variable is decided during the execution of the code which means when your program is running at that time whatever is being assigned to that variable based on that the type of the variable is decided so let me give you an example so what i will do is I'll directly run some code here in the console. Okay. So here I will create a variable. I'll call it a. So I'll say a is equal to 10. Okay. And I'll print 
the type. So first I'll print the variable itself. So you can see the so variable is a. Okay. Now let me print the type of variable. So you have this keyword type of which is used to get the type of any variable that you have. So I'm using this with the variable a and we are printing the output of this. So I'll press enter over here and you can see the type of this variable is a number. Fine. And it's number because we have assigned a whole number to it. And you can see it has 10 as of now. Now let me change the value of this variable. So I'll change this to, so let me change this to something. I'll say hello world and I'll press enter and I'll get the type again. And as you can see now, the type of this variable now is string. And that is because we have assigned it a string and it no longer holds a number as of now. So this is how dynamic typing works. Now let me assign it another value. So I'll say a is equal to, I'll say false. So this is a Boolean type now. Okay. I'll press enter. Now I'll have to execute this command here. Okay. And to get that, I'll press the up arrow. So if you are running anything in browser and if you wish to execute something you have written previously, you can just keep pressing the up arrow. So I'll just print this and you can see the type now is Boolean and Boolean because we have assigned it with a value false. So this is nothing but what is a dynamic typing and JavaScript is a dynamically typed language. Okay. Which means variable types are defined based on the value that is being stored. And this is done during the runtime. All right. This is very different from programming languages like Java. So if you're coming from that background, you would be a little bit confused, but that's perfectly fine. Every language has its own set of features. And this is one feature of JavaScript wherein you are allowed to store any type of value in a variable during the course of execution of the program. This won't be the case with a programming language like Java. So if you have declared a variable as an integer or a number, you are only allowed to store that in it. You cannot assign it a string. All right. So that's JavaScript for you. So I hope you guys have a fair clarity of what dynamic typing is and how it works in JavaScript. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys. Welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to start working on our number guessing game. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity as to what you're going to build and how we will be incorporating the concepts we have learned so far in this game. So let's get started. So we have a few variables created and we are printing the value of answer here. So I'll just remove this. Okay. We don't need to print the value of answer. So we now have only four variables. Okay. And the remainder of our code is very simple. We are just going to print out the instructions for the player and ask them to press a key when they are ready to see the answer. In fact, we will ask them to press a key during each stage so that they get the instructions one step at a time. All right. So what I will do is I will start typing in console dot log. Okay. And I'll say, think of a number between one and 10 press enter when ready. All right. 
so we have this statement here okay now here we are telling you need to think of a number between 1 and 10 and you press enter when ready so i need to use a function here okay after this line so the function is prompt now prompt function waits until a key is pressed which is what we want the program to do we are not interested in which key the user has pressed we just want to wait until they are ready so in short we just want to give user some time to think of a number okay so the rest of the program is just more or less the same so i'll just copy this and i'll paste it and we'll change the message here so we'll say multiply your number so I'll, I'll just delete this message first okay and i'll say multiply your number by and i'll say first number okay and here i'll say dot press enter when ready all right so we have still got some instructions to show okay and i don't know about you but i'm going to get bored typing press enter when ready each time okay so of course i could copy paste it but it makes more sense to store it in a variable instead okay and this video is about variables after all so i'll add it and we can do any printing after answer okay so what i will do is i will copy this okay and i will add a variable here at the top okay i'll say let message and i'll paste it here okay and this should be in a single quote or a double quote that's fine and we'll end this with a semicolon i'll just increase the area of the editor okay and so that you can see much more clearly okay now here we have this variable here sorry we have this message here so what i can do is i can just delete this and i can say plus message okay and same we can do for this statement here as well okay so i'll just remove this and i'll say message all right so it looks much more cleaner what we have done is we were repeating a message here which we added to a variable so we created a variable out of that message and now we are using that variable in place of the message okay so we need to do some more typing over here okay so i'll just copy this again okay and i'll paste it here and the next set of instruction is we need to say multiply number okay so i'll have to say now multiply the result by okay and i'll say second number over here and i'll copy this again and i'll paste it here okay we'll say now divide the result by the number you originally thought of okay and i'll remove this for now fair enough so we have this message now and again i'll need one more message so i'll just copy this and i'll paste it over here and i'll say now subtract okay plus subtraction plus message all right so these are all the instructions so first we are instructing the user to think of a number between 1 and 10 then we are asking the user to multiply the number by the first variable which is nothing but 2 here then we are multiplying the result by second number which is nothing but 5 and then we are asking the user to divide the result with the number you originally thought of okay and then we ask the user to subtract the number with 7 all right 
Now, you may have noticed that we are using the plus operator over here, all right? And you may have used, or you may be used to the plus symbol when it's used for addition. But when dealing with strings, JavaScript uses plus to join one string to the end of another. And that's called concatenation. So just a minute, I hear you thinking that first number and second number are not strings, they are numbers. So how can we add a number to a string? The answer is JavaScript is clever enough to work out what we want to use the string representation of a number. When it sees plus being used like this, it knows that we are not trying to perform an arithmetic operation. Instead, it appends the value to the string as characters. So we'll be coming back to this and seeing another way to combine values with the string input. Sorry, not the string input, but the string output. All right, so that's the end of the instructions over here. It's a very simple game. And the final step is to work out what the answer is and then print it in the front of the user or print it to the user. So we'll say answer is equal to first number into second number minus subtraction. All right. So this is the equation and we will be saying, cons sorry, not confirm, but it's console dot log. And I'll say the answer is answer. All right. So that's our code. Okay. And it's time to run the program and see if it works. So I haven't saved my file yet, which is why I'm not seeing the output here. Okay. The moment I save, this will refresh and I'll start seeing the output. So I'll press save and you can see the message here, okay? So you can see, think of a number between one and 10. Press enter when you are ready. Now we don't have to type the number in. The computer is going to work out the answer without knowing our origin, what our original number was, okay? So I'll think of a number and I'll think of six, let's say. Okay, so I'll press enter now or press okay. If enter doesn't work, press okay, please. So you see another message now, okay, that multiply your number by two, okay? So six times two is 12, but again, don't type that in, okay? We just need to press enter, enter, and so on, okay? So I'll press okay. Now multiply the result by five and enter when ready. Okay, so 12 times five is 60. I'll make a note of that and I'll move to next step. Now divide the result by the original number you thought of, okay? And the original number was six. So 60 divided by six is 10, okay? I'll press okay. And the final step is to subtract seven, okay? So I'll subtract seven and 10 minus seven is three. Okay. And I'll say, okay, over here. And you can see the answer is three over here, which means the computer has got the answer that you thought of. Okay. So the answer is three over here. Okay. And that's impressive. So computer has got it pretty right. Now, this will look impressive, but you will be less impressed after running the program a few times and seeing that the answer is always three. Okay. If you're not sure why it's always three, Google something like math tricks or maths mind reading. You will find lots of similar tricks to practice with. We can improve things to make the program less predictable, but we'll do that in the next video where we will also discuss why the program uses 
first number, second number and subtraction rather than just using the numbers they represent. All right. So that's about this class, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. OK, in this lecture, we actually wrote our number guessing program and we saw it working. So I'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello, guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to examine our code for number guessing game. And we are going to discuss why we use variables. So let's get started. So if you scroll up or let me expand this editor a bit. OK, you will see we are using message quite a few times. So if you highlight or select any message variable, you will see everything being highlighted. OK, and all the occurrences of message you can see at a single glance. So message variable is obvious. We use it at the end of every line of output and it saves us typing the same thing each time. There is another advantage as well as saving the typing. It makes it very easy to change our instructions if we find that the things are not clear. So for example, we have written here, press enter when ready, but actually enter didn't work for me. It might work for you, but it didn't work for me. So I had to press OK. So I can change press OK when ready. OK, at a single place and it will be reflected everywhere. OK, so I don't have to go and change on every line. Because if that's the case, I might miss a line or I might make a mistake. All right. So there are these possibilities. So by defining or by declaring this particular ending string as a message variable, we have a better control. So I just changed at one place and we have it being reflected everywhere. So that's another advantage. Also, I mentioned when running the program that you don't have to type in the answer. OK, so I can even add that to the message. All right. So I'll say don't type in the answer. OK, just press OK when ready. All right. And now if I save this and if I go over here, you will see the message being reflected everywhere. All right. So message makes sense. We use the string values several times. So it makes sense to store it in a variable. But what about subtraction? Its value doesn't change and we could just use the number seven instead. What I mean is I could change the code. OK, so I'll just comment this. OK, so I'll add two slashes. And I can scroll down and instead of subtraction, I can say seven. OK, I'll add a space here. And here as well, we are using subtraction. So I'll add seven. Now I won't run it, but if you do, you may see a warning that subtraction isn't used. OK, so if you haven't commented this, you might see a warning, OK, but your Visual Studio is not highlighting us any warning. OK, the program will work as expected. OK, but before I undo these changes, notice that we have had to make the changes in more than one place. Forgetting one of those changes would have introduced a bug and the instructions wouldn't match the calculations that the computer is performing and the answer wouldn't be correct. OK, so I'll undo the change. I'll press Control Z subtraction and I'll say subtraction. All right. Now JavaScript has a math object which is inbuilt and we can use that to make the game a bit less obvious. Instead of using the same rules for our variables, 
we can get JavaScript to generate random numbers. Okay. So I'll just reduce the width of this because we are going to need our browser here now. So we have seen math.random method being used in the ELISA program. So let's see how to use it. So we are here using the random method. Okay. So what I will do is I'll say math.random. Okay. And I'll put two brackets here. Okay, you can see the random number being generated. Now, here the random number is being generated with decimal points, but we need without decimal points. Okay, so if you run it twice, you will see two different numbers being generated and three different numbers being generated. Okay, now to get a number between two and nine, we need to multiply by eight and add two. Okay, so what I will do is I'll say multiply by eight and I'll add it by two. Okay, so you can see that we are now getting the random number between two and nine. So I can just keep running and you can see that is what we are getting here. All right, then we can use one more function which is inbuilt in JavaScript to get a single decimal value, which is the floor function. Okay. So what I can do is I can say math dot floor. Okay. And I'll pass the output of math dot random into math dot floor and I'll keep running it. So you can see now, this particular math.floor function has trimmed out the decimal values out of the output. Okay. So we have got a way to generate random numbers. All right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this and I'll start pasting it over here. So I'll say, so I'll paste it over here first. Okay. And then for the second number, and then for the subtraction as well. All right. I will uncomment this as well. Okay. Now remember to save the changes. Okay. And once we save the changes, we will be seeing the output in the browser. But before that, I'll mention a couple of points that now the instructions will be different. The numbers are being generated randomly and the final answer will be different. If we hadn't used variables, we would have struggled to make this change. Okay. I'll just save the program here. Okay. And you can see, think of a number between one and 10. Okay. Multiply, divide. So everything is working fine. You can just play around with this program. Okay. By yourself. Now I'm going to finish this video with a question and a small challenge. The question is, do we have to wait until, so let me scroll down. So do we have to wait until line number 17 that I have highlighted over here? Okay. So this line, so do we have to wait until this particular line to give answer its value? All right. Answer is a variable here. So do we have to wait until this line to give answer its value? So pause the video and have a think about it. Okay. And once we are back, we will be ready for a challenge. All right. So that's about this class guys. So in this lecture, we learned why we use variables. We learned how variables make our life easy and efficient as a programmer. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys. Welcome to this class. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the challenge. Okay. So the challenge that we had in the previous lecture was a question. And the question was, do we have to wait until this line 
to calculate the value of answer and the answer to the question is no we don't have to wait until this line and answer can be given its value at the same time it's declared so the challenge is to modify the code so that the answer is initialized on this line line number four which i have highlighted and this is a place where we are declaring this variable this variable answer does not rely on anything that user types in we know the values of everything we need right at the start of the program all those instructions are just smokes and mirrors to make the player think that something's clever is happening because first number second number and subtractions have been declared and initialized at the start so we can use them to initialize answer on line four the line which i have highlighted so you can pause the video and do the refactoring or changing the code i'll do the modifications shortly so i'll start with the modification at my end so i'll just cut this here and i'll delete this line okay i'll scroll up and i'll paste it over here okay and i'll assign it to the variable answer okay so far so good now you can run the program and make sure it still works after the change what is important here is that answer was given a value before we used it we print out the value of answer over here on line 17 so we must assign a value to answer before then it doesn't matter where we do that as long as it's done before this line where we are using it it probably doesn't make much sense to do it in the middle of printing the instructions that would just confuse anyone reading the code but you could do that too the program would still work fine all right so i'll stop the video here right now and in this lecture we completed the challenge and the challenge was the question where we moved the calculation of answer at the top because we have everything we need for its calculation so that's about this class guys i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the naming conventions. We discussed naming our variables in earlier video. In this video, I'm going to take a few minutes to discuss the naming conventions that JavaScript programmers use when creating names for various JavaScript objects and variables. So I have this link open here in my browser and I'll add a link in the resources along with this video. This link is a summarized version of the conventions that we should use. The table can be useful as a reminder and the document contains examples as well as a brief explanation of why the conventions are used. Once again, some descriptions will refer to things that don't make sense yet. If you are just starting out, I'm going to condense all that into the next couple of minutes. I'll start by reviewing why these coding conventions exist in the first place. So the JavaScript conventions are more or less similar to the programming languages like Java. The main reason for coding conventions is to help humans read the code. In most cases, the compiler doesn't care. Having said that, some conventions can help prevent problems in your code. Adhere to the convention, even if you disagree with it. The different conventions can help to remind which language you are using. 
So I regularly switch between JavaScript, Java, Python, and a few other languages. It's easy to forget which language you're using and the conventions help there. If all the code I'm working on is written in a certain style, I'm less likely to type Java code into a JavaScript program, for example. So on this link, you can see different conventions. So here you have the object name as, so this is a function name and the notation or the convention that is followed is camel case. For function arguments also camel case, local variables camel case, constant names Pascal case and field name we use camel case again. So camel case is a convention wherein the first word has all small letters in lowercase. And if there is one more word along with the name, you have the first letter in the uppercase syntax. Okay. So that becomes camel case. And the reason this is uppercase, the first letter of the second word is uppercase is because it enhances the readability. So in Python, you will have underscore as a separator to enhance the readability. But in JavaScript, we have the camel case format. Okay. And this is similar to Java. Okay. You can go through this document here. Okay. And you can read about uh, different things. You will also understand the code indentation is not that important in JavaScript. So if you want to group a block of code, you have to use a pair of curly braces as you can see over here. Okay. But there is always a recommendation out there. Okay. So you can always use four spaces for indentation of code blocks. All right. So, so this is a very handy document that you should go through. All right. Now let me switch over to my presentation to give you some examples of conventions. So here you are seeing two code snippets. So one of these code snippets is in Java and the another one is in JavaScript. Can you tell me which is which? I'll give you a few seconds to examine the code and see if you can tell the difference. Okay, so you must have guessed it right. The code on the left hand side of the slide is written in Java and the code on the right hand side is JavaScript. So the convention in Java is that the class or is that the class name should start with a capital letter. As you can see in the highlight, the name of the class is programmed so that it has a capital letter. We have not discussed classes yet, but JavaScript even has a concept of classes and JavaScript classes should start with capital letters and should be Pascal case if it contains more than one word. The next JavaScript convention is to start method names with a lowercase letter and use camel case if it has more than one words. And as you can see, the naming convention in Java is similar to this one. Moving on to variable names. Variable names are written in lowercase. If they have multiple words, then the second word is started with a capital letter. That makes the names more readable. This is also similar to programming language Java. Case is important in JavaScript, but don't create two objects or variable names with names that differ only in the case of letters. In JavaScript, two variables or objects having different case are considered as two different variables. It is not recommended to create two variables with the same name, but different case since names cannot differ by case alone. So you can see this example over here. These are three different variables, but don't do this. Okay. It's very confusing. So that's about this class guys. In this lecture, we discussed the JavaScript naming conventions, and I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class super valuable. I shall see you guys soon.
थैंक यू हेलो गाइस वेलकम बैक एंड इन दिस लेक्चर वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस द नेमिंग कन्वेंशन चैलेंज सो वी हैव गॉट अ चैलेंज फॉर यू एंड फॉर दैट यू हैव टू क्लोज दिस फाइल व्हिच इज ओपन राइट नाउ एंड वी विल मूव टू आवर एलाइजा प्रोजेक्ट सो हियर वी हैव आवर एलाइजा प्रोजेक्ट एंड आई विल ओपन द डॉक्टर डॉट जे एस फाइल ओके आई विल कोलैप्स दिस so we discussed the javascript naming convention in one of our last videos now here's the challenge so the programmer who wrote this doctor class or doctor.js file was fired from the company for failing to adhere to the naming conventions and as you will see later in the course they should have probably have been fired for other reasons as well but you have just joined the company and you have been given the job of making this code conform to the javascript naming convention now there are eight deviations from the conventions at least eight that we are aware of bear in mind that eight deviations result in more than eight places where the code has to be changed if a variable is being used for example in three places then that single deviation will result in three changes to the code it's also possible to have more than one deviation on the same line the challenge is to fix the code so that it does conform to the convention there is a way to make the task easier but i'm not going to show you what it is just yet it is very important to become proficient at checking code so that you can spot small differences very easily you will also find that you will get errors as you make changes a change on one line will cause problems later in the code getting used to seeing errors will make life much easier in future because you will know what you have just changed you will find that fixing errors is really really easy so i am not just being mean by refusing to show the easy way now or maybe i am just feeling mean but don't worry if you don't find all the problems and if you find some but aren't sure how to fix them that's fine too so the aim of this challenge is to get you used to reading code carefully most of the code that you see and read won't make a lot of sense but have a go at spotting the non conforming parts you will learn a lot from doing it and i'll go over the solution in the next lecture so that's about this class and the challenge guys give this challenge a go and watch the solution in the next lecture so that's about this class i'll see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome to this class so in this lecture we are going to discuss the solution for the naming convention challenge so let's get started so did you manage to find all the eight problems in doctor.js and if so did you manage to fix any of them checking code very carefully is a skill that gets you better the more you do it it may have taken you a while to find even one of them but it's definitely something you will get faster at okay so i'll scroll down and we'll start looking at the first problem that we have in our code okay so the first problem that we have in our code is on this line over here where we are creating the random variable now random variable is not following the naming convention okay so you can see it's starting with capital r so i'll rename this to a small r all right you can even name it as random numbers which is completely fine but i'll stick to keeping it random now 
you may have continued working through the code, spotting the problem as you go. That approach can make life difficult. We have just made a change and that has caused some errors in the code. Okay, so we have renamed this variable. Okay, and this variable is being used at multiple places in our code. So it makes sense to fix the errors that are arising because of this change immediately. Okay, doing it later might get confusing. Okay, and you might not know why a particular error is happening. So since we made this change, I'll immediately fix the errors before continuing. Okay, so I'll hit save. Okay, and I'll open Eliza.html on the server. So I'll just cut this and I'll minimize this and we will go to this URL now. Okay. All right. So this is Eliza code. Okay. Now the moment we save it. Okay, we are not seeing any errors as of now. So I'll just type in a message. Hi. And there you see. So we have not got the bot response. And if you open this, you see an error that random is not defined. Okay, and this is happening on line number 176. As you can see over here, the line number is also coming. So if you scroll down, okay, so I go down to line 176. You can see over here, random is being used. Okay, so the error is not that obvious, but you can see three lines over here. And if you hover on this, you will see could not find name random. Did you mean random? Okay, so I can just rename it and save. Okay, and let me try again. So I'll say hi, enter. Okay, so it's working fine now. So the error is fixed. Okay, even we even have one more way of managing these kinds of errors. So I would like to show that to you as well. So I'll press Control Z. Okay, and I'll press I'll scroll up and I'll press Control Z over here as well. So now this is not adhering to the naming conventions. So instead of directly changing the name over here, I'll use a Visual Studio Code feature, wherein I'll say rename symbol. So I'll right click on this variable and I'll say rename symbol and I'll change this to small r and I'll press enter. Now the moment I do this, if I scroll down, okay, here, you will see automatically this was renamed. So this is a very handy feature of Visual Studio Code. And this is also one of the benefits of using an ID. So I renamed a variable at one place and all the occurrences of that variable were automatically renamed by the IDE. Otherwise, I have to just scroll through and figure out where all I use that variable. Okay. And if you have not written that code, then your life becomes much more difficult. So this is one amazing feature of Visual Studio Code. This feature is also available in other IDs for other programming languages like Java and so on. Okay. So this is one variable. Okay. And this is one occurrence or one deviation that we have just fixed. Okay. So now, if you scroll down the code to make response method, you will see a couple of more problems over here. So the response method over here should have had the R as capital. So make response is two word. Okay. And in order to adhere to the naming convention, this should have been a capital R. And same goes for the user input. The I should have been in uppercase. So they are not adhering to the camel case convention over here. Okay. So what I will do is I will rename this. So I'll say rename symbol and I'll say R 
make response, enter. And I'll rename symbol over here. I'll say capital I. All right. Now, since I just renamed the symbol, okay, all the occurrences. So if I highlight this, if I select this variable, you can see all the occurrences of user input and they have been renamed successfully because I used rename symbol option of Visual Studio Code. Okay, if you are changing it manually, you can even do that, but that is a bit more of a hassle, okay? And I'm teaching you the best practices right now, okay? So if your code is very lengthy, these features are very handy and helps you avoid common mistakes, all right? Now here on the next line, we have position, okay? Which is also not adhering to the naming convention. So I'll just say rename symbol and I'll change this to small p, okay? So we have been able to rename it at all the places now, okay? And if I scroll down a bit, okay, we have a fourth deviation, okay, which is, okay, which is over here on line number 146, okay? So the output starts with a capital O and it is being used over here at couple of places. So I'll just say, rename symbol and I'll change this to small o and I'll press enter and you will see it being renamed everywhere else. Okay. Now this was output. So if you scroll down a bit, you will see a variable that is being used in the for loop and that is variable i. Okay. And it's a counter and it has to be in a lower case. So I'll just right click rename symbol and I'll change it to small i. And the renaming has been successful. Okay. Now, okay, we renamed position as well. Okay. Now we have six problems fixed so far and we have two left to go. Okay. So if you scroll down, okay, and uh, here, like on line 174, which I have highlighted, you can see remainder variable starting with a capital R, which is not correct. So I'll rename it to small r. Okay, perfect. And if you did rename it manually, you will have to rename it at the bottom. So here you will have to rename it wherever the occurrence is there. So here on line 188, okay, and Okay, so I think it's being used only on one line, line 188, I'm sorry. Okay, so this is done. Now, let me scroll down and we have only one problem to fix, okay? Okay, so there's a problem with random index. So this cannot start with a capital letter and here we are again not adhering to the naming convention. So I'll just rename symbol and I'll enter small r in the pop-up and I'll press enter. The changes are done, okay? And if you manage to find all or any of these problems, well done. Even better if you have managed to fix any of them, okay? And if you didn't, don't worry. As I said at the start of the challenge, this was designed to get you used to examining the code carefully you can't read a code like you read a book, okay? You have to concentrate on every line and check the names of all the variables while paying attention to things like capitalization. It's a skill that takes time to develop, but it does improve the more you practice. The more you read and write the code, the better you'll become at it. Okay, so what I will do is I'll scroll up and I believe we have a couple of more uh, deviations which I'll fix over here. So your new line, this cannot be underscore. So I'll rename this to new and L has to be caps. Okay, this is done. And here messages list. So I'll rename this. 
so this again has to be this way okay so this is done and fixed if you can find more deviations okay you can edit it yourself and you can even post it in q a to let me know as well okay i'll finish this video by opening the eliza.js file so i'll just save this and i'll move to eliza.js okay so main.js not eliza.js so i'll go to main.js and here if you scroll down you can see that we have renamed the make response method but we haven't made the changes over here okay and you will spot this issue if you run this program so if i say hi enter you won't get an output and you will get an error main.js line number 52 which is this so it's not able to locate this method of course because we have renamed it so i'll change this to capital r and i'll hit save and we will test it so i'll say hi or you can type whatever you should just get a response okay so it's working fine all right so it's very important that you test the program once you make any change to make sure that it's working correctly and we have not broken anything while making the change all right so i'll leave you to run the program and make sure it still works after the changes so in this lecture we went through the challenge solution which was for our naming convention and i hope you guys have a fair clarity now so that's about this class guys i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome to this class so in this lecture we are going to summarize this section so we started this section by discussing variables in javascript javascript is an untyped language which means that variables declared in javascript can hold the value of any data type this is different from programming languages like c sharp java where declaring a variable involves giving it a name and specifying its type a variable can be given a value at the same time that it's declared you don't have to do that you can assign a value to it later what is important is that it must be given a value before you try to use it if you try to use a variable in a calculation before you are given it a value then you will get an error in your code we looked at javascript naming conventions that we should use when naming our variables and other objects sticking to the javascript naming conventions make code easier to read as well as providing information on what kind of object something is we saw that class names start with a capital letter and are written in pascal case method names start with a lowercase letter and are written in camel case variable names start with lowercase letter and are written in camel case again we shouldn't give different objects names that differ only in their case with javascript type of a variable is not specified explicitly the naming convention challenge gave us a chance to practice the javascript naming convention and a useful experience at modifying the code there is a lot of code in eliza project that won't make sense yet but we have made a start towards understanding it all so that's about this class guys and also this section i hope you guys enjoyed this section and found it valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to do a section introduction 
So in this section, we are going to look at how can you modify the HTML DOM, which is document object model and manage events from the user interface. HTML is what is displayed in the browser and user sees and interacts with it. We are going to write a simple menu program to see how to detect a single key press in our code. Detecting a button key press is useful, but we will often want to allow users to make a choice on the interface. Building user interfaces that interact with users and accept responses is key to building web applications. You will often want to print more than just basic strings. We will talk about how string interpolation can be used to include the values of variables in the output. String interpolation allows the values to be embedded within the strings. It's got a quite grand name, but you will see that it's much easier than it sounds. So that is what we'll cover in this section. And I'm so excited to teach you all. So that's about this class guys. I'll see you inside. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss how can you work with DOM. So DOM stands for document object model. So that is something that we are going to learn in this lecture. Okay. Now, before talking about DOM, I would like to talk about HTML. So here I have a simple menu HTML file that I have got on my machine. And this is a file that you will find along with this lecture in the resources section, you can download it. So if you open this file, and if you zoom in a bit, okay, so you will see that the HTML page has a lot of elements. And these elements are the ones that are rendered in the browser, which is viewed by the user. Okay, so let me copy this. So I'll copy. I'll go to my Visual Studio code. And let us create a folder here. So I'll create a folder called simple menu. And within simple menu, I will add a file, I'll call this index.html. And I'll paste that entire HTML over here. Okay. And I'll just close this. So this is better. So the ID gives you some syntax highlighting over here. Okay. Now you will notice the code over here and you can see that there are different elements. So these are elements. So this is head element body and these are known as tags as well. So there's a body tag, head tag, you can see dev tag and so on. And every element will have some properties that are associated with it. So for example, this div element has this property class. Okay. This button has a property type class and so on. So every element will have some properties associated with it. All right. And that is how our HTML is structured. Now, when I run this, so if I say right click open with live server, okay, you will see this being rendered in the browser. So you can see over here, it's being rendered in the browser. And you can see like H1 tag is please choose one of the following. And you are seeing the same thing over here being rendered. Now this is how HTML is rendered and can be viewed in the browser. Now we have a concept of DOM, which means document object model, where the page is represented in the form such that its structure and content can be changed by the programs. Now this change can be done by scripting language, JavaScript. Okay. So JavaScript can modify the contents of the page. Okay, the contents of the HTML page. So 
here we saw the tags okay and we saw how it is represented in the browser now what we will be doing is we will be playing around with this html file a bit so i will go over here and just below the body tag i will add a script tag so i'll say script okay and here i'll say src here i'll say main.js i'll hit save and i will also create a main.js file all right so we have a javascript file here okay i'll close everything else so i'll close this I'll close this and i'll close this okay so we have just two files open index.html which we just created some time back and we have main.js which we have added as a javascript file into the index.html so now let me add okay no so i'll just delete this and i'll show you the console let me open the console here so you can see there is nothing being printed on the console but let me get the document okay so i'll say console dot log and i'll say document dot body and i'll hit save okay now with the above code the moment you hit save you will see some output being printed on the console and this is the entire document being printed so if you expand this you can see the entire code over here okay you will see some additional code which is not the part of your html that you have written so you can see here code injected by live server so this is something that is injected by live server on the fly which you can ignore okay so this code and the script okay but this is the script that is being added from our index.html here okay so we have been able to get the entire body okay with the help of this one single line okay now we have been able to access body now the question is how do you access elements in the body tag okay you can see that html tags have a hierarchy so if i just close this for a bit and if i say right click inspect okay you will see there is a body tag okay okay so i'm also seeing this grammarly uh tag here okay but this is something because of the extension that i'm using so i'll i'll just delete this for a while so i'll say delete element okay so you have this body tag okay and you can see how this is a hierarchy so if you open this you will see within body tag you have a div tag okay and you can actually collapse this div tag and within div tag you have button 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 so all these buttons are within the div tag along with the span all right so this is the hierarchical nature of html that is being rendered okay and this is this is something that you can see in the code as well so here you have body tag you have dev then within dev you have all these elements that are part of this dev all right so this is the hierarchical nature of html now you can navigate through the elements in the dom using a dot but how do you access any element directly okay so html files can be large with a lot of tags okay so let me show that to you so for accessing any arbitrary element from the html you can use document dot get element by id okay and you can pass id as the parameter okay so let me show you what i mean over here so let's say you have a tag span over here and let's say you wish to get this span tag okay in javascript and you can see there is an attribute associated with this span tag which is id now you can get the span tag by referring to this id so let me do that so the id is output over here okay so i can say document dot 
get element by id you can see this auto suggest here okay and you can see output you can say output over here and you can navigate to console and i'll hit save so you can see we've got the span tag over here being printed and we have got that because what we have done is we have said console.log okay document dot get element by id so what this says is it says from the document get this element by id and the id is output and that is what you see being printed as the output on the console so keep in mind one thing this id has to be a unique identifier for the tag okay you can't have two tags with the same id okay like you can but it's best to have unique ids okay so for every element and you can access it through the javascript in this way now you have access to more methods using which you can access an element or a group of elements okay so let me show that to you so i'll execute some commands in the console over here okay what i will do is i'll just expand this here all right so i'll say document dot get element by tag name okay and i'll say over here button and i'll press enter so you can see all the buttons coming up over here okay so these are all the buttons and you can see there are seven buttons on the interface so what we are doing is we are saying get elements by tag name and the tag name we have given is button if you add one more button the count will be eight okay so get it this way so this is how you can get a group of buttons you can even get a single button okay so since this is a collection of buttons you can say i want to get the first button so you can get the first button over here so you can see cappuccino is the first button that you have got also in the previous query that we ran this previous one if you expand this you will see all the buttons okay so you can see all the properties of the buttons and it's all being printed here all right so this is how you can get a single button okay you have to add this zero so you're getting the button at the zeroth index you can get the button at the first index and so on okay you can even get a value of a button so i can say get elements by tag name button one dot value and you can say enter okay so since there is no value associated with this button you didn't get any output but what i can do is i can add a value attribute so i can say value is equal to one and i can hit save okay and you can run the previous code over here okay so i'll say zero and you can see one being printed okay so this is how you can get the value or any attributes value from the uh, get elements by tag name method okay so you can see how powerful this is and how powerful javascript can get so html here is defining the structure of the page outline but by able to get the elements on the fly in a script you can see how much power it adds to a page okay so that's the power of javascript and that's about this class so in this lecture we understood how can you work with the document object model and how can you access the elements using dom so i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to talk about events and event handlers by the end of this lecture you will have a complete clarity as to 
how can you trigger events and how can you even handle them so let's get started so far we have got the element on the page and we have been able to successfully print it on our console but what we need to get is we need to get the element and we need to even understand which button was click on the HTML page. So here on the HTML page we have, I'll just collapse this a bit. You have buttons and th these are the buttons that users will interact with. And we should be able to judge or rather I should say we should be able to detect which button user has clicked and we should be able to handle the clicks appropriately. All right. So here is what we will be doing to get this done. So we will be triggering a event on the button click. So whenever I click any of these buttons, there will be an event that is being triggered. And on that event, we will have to get the information as to which of these buttons was clicked. Once we have identified which button was clicked, we will have to display the information of the click in the output. And by output, I mean this span tag over here. All right. So to start on this, let's talk about events. What are events? So events are actions that happen on the web page. Now by actions, I mean the button click is an event, okay? In our example, we have been selecting the coffee here, okay? So this is a program that enables users to select the coffee and you can see different coffee options that are being represented to the user. I'll just zoom in a bit, okay? Now user will be selecting the coffee of his choice by clicking on the button. So that's what is an event. Now to act on events, we need to handle them. And this is known as event handling. How do you handle events? So you can do that by defining something called as event handlers. Now, what are event handlers? So event handlers are functions that are triggered when a particular event occurs. Okay. So let me head over to our JavaScript file. And here I will define a event handler. So I'll just remove this. Okay. And I'll say function menu function. And I'll have a parameter here. Okay. Open curly braces. And here I'll say console dot log. And I'll say you choose and I'll print over the user choice. Finally, I'll end this with a semicolon. So here, what we have done is we have defined a function that is accepting a parameter user choice. So this is the parameter and it is printing it onto the console over here. Now we need to trigger this function on the click of this button. Okay. So on the click of this button, we need to trigger this function. So how do we do that? So for that, I'll save my JavaScript file and I will head over to index.html. I will expand this a bit. Okay. Now here beside value, I'll add an attribute and that attribute will be on click attribute. So I'll say on. So you can see this auto suggest on click. Okay. Now I'll say menu function over here. Okay. And this is a function that we have defined in our JavaScript code. Okay. So what we are saying is we are saying on the click of this button, so on click of this button, you need to call the menu function and menu function is something that we have defined in JavaScript. And like menu function accepts a parameter. So we need to pass the parameter over here. So we'll say this dot value. 
So I'll be passing the value and I'll end this with a semicolon. So the value is nothing but the value attribute. Okay. And what I will be doing is I will be replicating this or before replicating, let's try it out only for one button. Okay. So we have enabled this for cappuccino. So you don't see anything on console yet over here. Let me click cappuccino. You can see you chose one. If I click again, you can see you chose one twice. You chose one thrice and so on. Okay. So this is working perfectly fine. All right. So what is happening is from here. So when you click this event is triggered and this function is being called and the value of this attribute, like the value is one. So this value is being passed and it is being accepted by this function as user choice and it is being printed onto the console. All right, so far so good. So we will be replicating the same thing for the rest of the buttons here. Okay. I'll just copy paste everything here. Okay. And I'll change the value over here. So I'll say value is equal to two value is equal to three, four, five, six, and seven. And I will hit save. Now I'll go to my browser. I'll say you choose one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So you can see on the click of button, how we are able to make something happen. And this is very powerful guys. So trust me, like if you are able to, so you can imagine like this is a static page and JavaScript has added life onto this page. So that's the power of JavaScript for you. So that's about this class guys. In this lecture, we understood what are events and event handlers. We even implemented and we created our own button click event and we even defined a handler to handle it. Okay. So on the trigger of the click event on a button, we have a handler which prints out what has been clicked. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys. Welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to talk about how can you modify the document object model or DOM. By the end of this lecture, you will have a complete clarity on the process and you would have even tried out a hands-on example to modify the element on the HTML page. So let's get started. So we have our HTML file here. Okay. And we have been able to detect the event using this on click attribute and this function menu function. And we are printing right now what user is selecting from the browser, as you can see over here. Now, what I would want to do is rather than printing what user has chosen on the console, I would want to show the user's choice on the HTML itself. And we have a tag over here called span. So this is a span tag, which whose ID is output. And what we will be doing is when the user clicks the button, we would be showing what user has selected within the span tag. Okay. So just to demonstrate, I will right click, I'll say inspect and I'll scroll down. So I'll, I'll just, I'll scroll down here and here we can say, so here within this span tag yeah, so you can see the span tag over here we need to display the output okay so we will say edit as html and i can say something like this okay so you can see the output is coming over here you choose one okay so far so good 
So I'll just collapse this for now. Okay. And what we will be doing is I will refresh this page here and we will head over to the JavaScript file. Now here we will have to first get this span tag. Okay. And the ID for this tag is output. Okay. And we have already seen a method. Okay. And the method was get element by ID. So I can say console dot log. Okay. Document dot get element by ID. And I'll say output. Okay. And I'll go to the console here. Here. And I'll hit save. I'll just save this JavaScript file. Okay. And I'll click on this. So I'll say cappuccino. You can see we are getting the span tag. Okay. In the function. Now what we need to do is instead of printing it on the console. So we are getting this element over here. So I'll just remove the console.log statement like so. I, I need to add the output over here. So I'll say dot inner HTML. Okay. So I'll say inner HTML and I'll assign this a value. So I'll say H3. Okay. And a closing H3 tag H3. Okay. And I'll say you choose the user choice and I will again have the open curly braces and the ending inverted commas, not curly braces, but these speech marks. So you can see over here, what we have done is we have said document dot get element by ID output in our HTML. And I'll scroll to the right. Now we have added this string here. You choose within the HTML H3 tag. Okay. And so basically we didn't use the principle. We use the concept of string concatenation. Okay. And we are now displaying the output on the user interface. And inner HTML is nothing but a property wherein you can add an HTML if you have access to the tag. Okay. So let me show this to you how it works. So I just hit save and I'll say cappuccino. Okay. And if I just collapse this, you will see you choose one, you choose two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay. So, so far so good. So this is a uh, one, a small dynamic page that we have created with the help of HTML and a JavaScript. So I'm sure you will be happy and excited about what you have been able to achieve so far with JavaScript. Okay. So that's about this class guys. So in this lecture, we understood how can you modify the DOM or the document object model. Okay. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the events and DOM manipulation in Hammer Bitcoin. So by the end of this lecture, you will see all the concepts that you have learned so far actually being implemented in a real world game. And that will give you a overview of how these concepts can be applied into real world projects. So let's get started. So what I have done is I have downloaded the hammer Bitcoin entire project in this folder and you will find this entire folder in the form of a zip file attached with this lecture. Okay. So I've downloaded this and after unzipping, you will find these four files present within it. So what I will do is I will create a folder here. And I'll call this hammer Bitcoin. So this game hammer Bitcoin is a strategy game 
and it's a JavaScript conversion of an old computer game called Hammurabi. Now Hammurabi was a well-respected Babylon king. His figure is on the wall of the United States Supreme Court as one of the most influential lawgivers from the history. In the original game, the player takes on the role of Hammurabi and has to manage the land. The aim is to feed the people and plant through grain to provide food while also buying and selling of land. We have bought the game into the 21st century and this version involves mining Bitcoin to feed a company's employees and hopefully make a profit as well. So what I will do is I will simply open this folder and I'll drag all these files into the Hammer Bitcoin folder. All right. Okay, so the files have been added and what I will do is I'll right click on the index.html and I'll open it with the live server. So you should see a page which is something like this. Okay, and here you are seeing the introduction to this game. Okay, so you can read the introduction. What are your duties? Watch out for hackers and market crashes. Cash is general currency measured in bitcoins and so on. You can go through this and this thing displays which year of rule you are in. So since the game has just started, we are in the year one of our 10 year rule. Okay. And these are our stats as of now. So these many employees have starved. New employees are five. Employee count is hundred. We have 2,800 bitcoins, thousand computers and the computer price is 21. And these are some sliders using which you have to give input to the program. And here you have the restart and the next turn button. Okay. And if you scroll down, okay, there's nothing down, but you will see the output over there. Okay. You can play around with this game a bit. So how many computers will you sell? How much will you feed the employees and how much will you allocate for maintenance? I'll say next turn and you can see you have ruled wisely, your final rating is good. So this is my rating for the year one and I'm now in year two. Okay. And you can see your stats being updated as and when you play the game. Okay. So this is a game you can play around with it. Okay. Now what I want to talk about is I want to talk about how we have used some of the concepts in this program. So I'll just close all the files that we have open here and I'll open game.js. Okay. So here you can see this is the first JavaScript file. So if you check index.html and if you scroll down, okay, not scroll down, but at the top, you will have two JavaScript files. One is game.js and Bitcoin miner.js. Okay. So within game.js, once the page loads, we print out an introduction. Okay. So this is a function that we are calling set intro. Okay. Within the intro function, we have an instance of Bitcoin miner created, and then we are printing the introductory paragraph. So this is a function that is being called from this class Bitcoin miner. So if you long press control, if you press and hold control and if you hover on this, okay, it's not taking me over there, but if you go to Bitcoin miner.js and if you scroll down here, you will see the print introductory paragraph over here. And here you can see how we are manipulating the HTML. So we are getting document dot get element by ID game introduction. Now this must be some HTML tag over here. You can see this is the HTML tag, empty HTML tag, and we are injecting the introduction from our JavaScript code. As you can see over here, we are getting the document dot get element by ID. This is something that we have done and tried in past few examples. We are saying in HTML and we are generating the HTML on the fly. 
okay so this is the introduction then when you go to game.js you will see we are also initializing the sliders so these are the sliders that you see on your screen so if you go to bitcoinminer.js and if you scroll down a bit okay the file is a bit longer so this is the init slider function wherein you are initializing all the sliders so you can see how we are getting the slider over here document.get element by id okay and this is a slider then so we have assigned it to a variable and then we are setting the min for the slider and max to the slider and the value and the step so step denotes like if you drag the slider by how much of value it should increase so that's the step so this is something that we are doing okay for the sliders to initialize within game.js we have set stats as well okay so within set stats so if you go to bitcoin minor js you have set stats over here at the bottom and here we are setting all the stats so you can see on the page this part over here okay so this is being set from here set stats so you have document.get element by id you're getting everything all the elements and you are assigning or setting up the stats or the values that you have within this game all right so this is how the document object model of this game is being manipulated okay on the fly so this is a very good example as to understand how things work in real world okay so right now i'm in the year two of my 10 year rule so i'll just press restart so let's say i just want to restart the game and you can see when i press restart everything was reset so including the stats the sliders and everything now what is this restart function so if you go to index.html if you scroll down you will have a restart button somewhere so this is the restart button okay restart and you can see on click game restart function is being called now what is game restart function so if you go to game.js you have this game restart function wherein you are creating an instance of the game a new instance of the game and this is new instance is being created from this class here so let me scroll up so you can see this class here okay and we are creating an instance of this class then we are initializing the slider so after we have the new instance we have initialized the slider set the stats and we have reset the game output so the game output is the text that you were seeing at the bottom over here okay so we have reset that and the game is completely fresh now so this is how restart function works okay on a click of button you are restarting the entire game okay so this is about restart and you can see how on click of one button we are just resetting everything okay and one thing also you should note is this thing wherein we are using the concept of document object model manipulation and we are resetting the game output all right and we are using the inner html property as well all right so i would request you all to just play around with this game and just go through a little bit of the source code okay and uh, if you don't understand much don't worry we'll cover major concepts that are being used in the game throughout the course okay so in the end you will have a clarity of how the game works so that's about this class guys in this lecture we created our hammurabi game which is hammer bitcoin and this is a javascript implementation of an old game called hammurabi and uh, we went through some of the concepts that have been used in this game like modifying the document object model and so on and we understood how it is being used in a real world program so that's about this class guys i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable 
I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the string interpolation in JavaScript. So let's get started. So to learn string interpolation, we will be creating a new folder over here and we will be adding some HTML and JavaScript files. And we will also be understanding how you can get values from the input boxes and even work with strings. So I have downloaded some resources over here, some HTML file. So this user input folder, which has index.html over here. So this will be attached with the lecture as a zip file. And if you unzip, you will see this HTML file within it. So what I will do is I will create a new folder. So I'll add a new folder in the root of the project and I'll call it user input. And within this folder, I will add this HTML file. Okay. So after we have added the index.html file here, I will just open it. Okay. And you can see some HTML code over here. All right. Now I'll load this HTML file on our live server. So right click and open with live server and you will see this page appear. Okay. So you can see this page has a name box, an input box for name and age along with the submit button. What we will be doing is we will be entering name and age in the input box and printing a summary in the output. Now, what is an output? So this is the output here. It's a span tag. Okay. Which we will be updating after you hit submit and we'll be doing this with the help of JavaScript. So there is already one JavaScript file associated with this HTML file. Okay, but we this JavaScript file does not exist yet. So I'll just copy this file name and we will create a file exactly with this name. Okay, so there you have the file. And now what I will do is I will start writing some code here. So I'll say function, say hello. And within this function, I will create a variable let name and I'll get the name from the HTML page that user has entered. So I will say document dot get element by ID. Okay. We need to get the ID of the name over here. So if you scroll to the right, the name field has ID also as name. Okay. If you don't want to jump into the HTML, what you can do is you can click on this. You can right click, say inspect, expand this a bit and you can see the ID over here. So this is name. Okay. So I can happily say name over here and I'll press enter. Okay. So we need to do this for name as well as the age. Okay. And if you scroll down here, you have age as well. Okay. And the ID for age is also age. So I'll add age and age. Okay. So we have two values over here. Okay. But what we are doing is we are getting the HTML tags over here. We are not getting the value that user has in entered, right? To get the value, you will have to say dot value. Okay. I will copy this and I'll paste it here as well. Fair enough. So we have the name and the age, whatever user is entering in the HTML page. Now we'll create one more variable. I'll call this as output. And this is the output that we will be printing. Okay. So I'll say name is plus name. Okay. 
So we are just printing the output. We'll say name is and each is I'll add space plus each. Okay. And then we'll say years old. I'll end this with a semicolon. Okay. Okay. So we have assigned this to the output. Okay. But instead what we can do is we can keep this as a string and we can get the output span over here. So I'll just duplicate this and I'll say output. Okay. So this is good. So we got the output span in the output variable. We have the string ready. So I can say output dot inner HTML is equal to this. Okay. So far so good. So I'll just expand this a bit so that you have a better visibility. So we have a function say hello. We are creating two variables name and age, which are fetching the value that user has entered on the form. We are creating a third variable called output, which has the tag with the ID output. And this is our span tag in the HTML file. You can go and see over here. One thing I would like to highlight that the ID should be exact. Like you cannot have spelling mistakes over here. If you make spelling mistakes, you get an error. Okay. And then we are updating the inner HTML of the output element with this string that we are creating on the fly. So we've written the event handler. Now what we need to do is, yes, we need to trigger this event. Okay. So what I will do is I'll copy, I'll go to index.html and on the click of submit button, I can say on click. Here, I can say, say hello and a semicolon. All right. And I can hit save over here. So I will just collapse this a bit. Okay. And I'll close this. So I'll refresh the page. I'll enter name as vessel and I'll enter the age as 22 and I'll say submit. Okay. Something went wrong. Let us see what went wrong. So I'll just go to our console here and you will, you are seeing say hello is not defined. Okay. And why is that not defined? Okay. We didn't save the main.js fair enough. Okay. These are some silly mistakes. So I'll just enter the name again, Faisal and I'll say age as 22 submit. You can see name is Fessel and age is 22 years old. Okay. So here, what we have done is we have added an event listener. So this thing is called as event listener, wherein you are registering like what happens on the click of this button. So we can even have this same thing done in JavaScript as well. So I'll just delete this from here for now. We saw this working. Now I'll head over to my JavaScript file and we'll add a couple of more lines and we will define that on click of submit button, this function is to be called say hello. Okay. So first what we need to do. So first we need to get the button submit. Okay. So I will say let submit button is equal to document dot get element by ID. Okay. And I'll say submit. So this is the ID of our submit button. Okay. You can just cross check to be double sure. Okay. And I'll just expand this a bit. I'll press enter and I'll say submit button dot add event listener. So this is the event listener, which says what happens when a particular event is triggered. And the event is on click. Okay. And I'll say comma, say hello, a semicolon. I'll say submit. Now let us see what happens when we enter our name. So I'll say enter 
I'll say 22 submit okay something is going wrong okay so one mistake over here instead of on click we need to say click over here and I'll say save and now if I enter vessel 22 submit you see this working as before okay and this won't work if you comment these two lines so I'll hit save I've commented the two lines and if I say vessel 22 submit it's not working you can see all right so yeah so this is a shortcut that I'm using to comment the selected code and you can find this shortcut so if you're curious as to what the shortcut is it's control and forward slash so you can say toggle line comment is what it's called so if you're using windows you can go to edit so windows mac or linux whatever you're using you can go to edit and check this shortcut here there is a possibility that this might be different for your machine depending on the kind of os so for windows it will be control and forward slash and for mac machines you need to check okay but this is a shortcut that you can remember very handy so you just select and you just toggle yeah pretty good so what we have done with the help of this example is we have learned how we can get the input from the input boxes and we have done some string interpolation here so we have modified or we have created our own string with dynamic values on the fly with the help of plus operator as you can see over here okay one thing i wanted to highlight here is the type of values that we are receiving from the user okay so what i will do is i'll press enter and i'll say console.log okay we'll just print the type of name and with semicolon and the age as well and i'll hit save okay and we'll see what the output looks like so i'll say vessel and 22 submit you can see both are being received as a string okay so we are receiving strings by default however we can cast it to a number by using the number function so there might be possibilities that age is a number and you might want to perform some operations on it and that won't be possible because we are getting it as a string here okay so how do you change the type of this to a number so i'll show that to you so in order to do that we'll create one more variable we'll say let num is equal to number so we can use this number function and we can pass the value over here okay and we will again print the type of num okay and i'll even add one more thing over here so i'll add and i'll concatenate this with num so let me refresh and i'll say vessel 22 submit so you can see string string then we have a number which is coming from here and it's 22 so we have used the concatenation concept here string concatenation and we have concatenated both these values all right so so far so good we learned about a number function here which is used to convert a string value into a number value okay so that you can perform arithmetic operations on the same so that's about this class guys in this lecture we learned about string interpolation wherein we created our string which we are printing as the output we created a new project user input and we learned how we can get the name and age from the user from input boxes and we even learned a new way of adding an event listener okay wherein you can add 
event handlers okay and define what happens on a click of a button or anything okay and we did this in javascript as well and we took a look at the number function which enables us to convert string numeric values to numbers so that's about this class guys i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to talk about string interpolation in javascript and this is something that we have already spoken about in one of our past lectures but we will be continuing the conversation on the same so i have this user input project open and from that project i have this main.js file open here so here on the highlighted line you can see we are concatenating the string to form an output and show it on the html page now we are creating a dynamic string here and this is a good way of creating dynamic strings but this may not be the best one concatenating values like this is a bit messy and all opening and closing speech marks that you can see over here can make it hard to read it becomes harder to maintain this once the string grows in size and it's very likely that you will make errors and mistakes but what's the solution here so the solution is to use the string interpolation which was introduced in es6 where we can have the string in backticks and within the dollar sign we also have curly brace and we can have an expression i'll just show it to you with the help of an example it sounds complicated but it's basically just involves surrounding the variable names with curly braces and adding the dollar sign in the beginning so what i mean here is i i'm talking about an expression that looks something like this okay so this code here or this line that i have added as in comment this is what the string interpolation is in the es6 version is okay so you have dollar you have curly brace sorry open curly brace and closing curly brace and then you have expression in between so i'll put the string interpolation way of producing the same output on the next line so what i will do is i will just comment this out okay and i'll copy this entire line okay and i'll paste it over here i'll overwrite this okay so the first thing that you need to do over here is you need to have backticks okay like this okay and then wherever you have the variable you need to add a dollar and you need to surround the variable by open curly brace and a closing curly brace like so okay i'll copy this again i'll delete this plus and speech marks okay and i'll change this to h so i'll just delete this entire thing and i'll like add h here so this is the another way of creating the same dynamic string and most ides will highlight the variable name in some way differently to the text and that makes it easy for you to tell that you have got curly braces present in the correct place and correctly matched up okay so if you make any mistakes here okay you will see color changes like this and you see all red marks so if you have done it in a proper way you will see proper highlighting over there now if i run this program okay if i save this if i say fessel and i say 22h submit we get the same output that we were seeing earlier okay and i think uh, this line that we just created the line number 6 highlighted by me is much more easier to read than the line above 
as long as you remember the dollar prefix it's also easier to type so i'll be using string interpolation in all the code from now on okay now what we have done to make the string interpolation work so to make the string interpolation work we have used the backticks so those are highlighted on the screen and this tells javascript to check for the variable names when they appear in the string okay so this is the indication now inside the string we can use var variable names wherever we would like to include their value so here we want name to be printed at the start of the string so when we want the value of the variable you enclose it with a curly brace okay and you prefix it with a dollar sign so as we have done over here all right after the word is we have we wanted to print the age so once again the variable name age is enclosed in the curly braces and prefixed it with a dollar sign this is much more readable easy to understand and easy to maintain and that's the basic of string interpolation so that's about this class guys so in this lecture we understood the string interpolation and how you can make it work okay we saw how you can make the process of creating dynamic strings so we had this version earlier and then we rephrased it with this one so this one is much more easier to read and use okay so that's about this class guys i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome to this class so in this lecture we are going to discuss and summarize this section so this section was focused on getting the information from the user and processing it we saw how dom can be accessed and manipulated we learned about events and event handlers and in fact we even defined one ourselves we explored the hammer bitcoin project which is a game it enabled us to understand how concepts we learned so far work in a real world project we saw how we can get input from the user via an html page and process it by default we get values as strings from the user if you want to do arithmetic operations on numeric values you have to convert them manually to numbers string interpolation allows dynamic values to be included in the output we took a look at this concept with hands on examples so we now know how to get input from the users of our program and even to display results we will be using these techniques throughout the course so you will get plenty of practice using them that's about this section guys i hope you guys enjoyed this section and found it valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to do a introduction to this section we have seen that we don't need to specify the types of the variable when we declare it This is different from programming languages like C# Sharp and Java. So in this section we will look at various types that JavaScript provides. Now there are quite a few but we will be focusing on the ones that you will use most of the time. We will see how variables are used in expressions with examples of numeric and boolean expressions. There are few lectures or videos on boolean expressions including compound expressions that use and and or. We have also got a challenge to get used to how they work. Later in the course we will cover classes in detail but because javascript is an object oriented programming language we have got a short introduction to classes in this section. 
We will look at what an instance of a class is and we will learn about fields. There's also an introduction to public and private class members. So that's about this class guys. I'm excited to start this section. So I'll see you inside. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to talk about primitive types in JavaScript. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a complete clarity as to what are the different primitive types that exist in JavaScript. So when we looked at variables in the earlier sections, we used number and string types without really saying much about them. Now it's time to have a look at the built-in types. Built-in types are a part of language and are often called as primitive types. With some languages, you have to declare the type of the variable and then you have to assign a value. That is not the case with JavaScript. JavaScript is a dynamically typed language which means that you don't need to specify the type of a variable when declaring it. If you are coming from a programming background like Java or C Sharp, you will know that every variable you declare must have a type before you use it. So JavaScript built-in types are broadly categorized as number, string, boolean, undefined and null. So these are the broad categorization of JavaScript primitive types. We have already used two types in our examples. One is number and string. We'll talk about Boolean in more detail at the end of this section. And then again in the next section, when we look at testing conditions. The non-numeric type we have will be string. A string is really a sequence of character. I'm going to talk about object later in the course when we look at classes. There's not a lot more to say about string. Variables of string type store text. The string type does have one thing in common with the numeric types. They are all immutable. That means their value can't be changed. It's probably obvious that the value phi can't be changed. It's always five. The same is true of a string. If we have a string, hello Faisal, we can't change it to be goodbye Faisal. It may appear to be possible because some of the methods available for working with strings, but trust me, strings can't be changed. When they appear to be changed, a new string gets created instead. That can have implications on performance and memory, and we'll talk more about that later. So that's about this class, guys. I hope you guys have a fair overview of the primitive types in JavaScript. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to talk about the number type. By the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity as to what number type is, and you will also understand a bit more about this type that exists in JavaScript. So JavaScript has inbuilt number type, which can be used to store numbers. Now numbers here are both integers and floating point values. JavaScript does not have separate types for floating point and integer values. So integer and floating point data type in JavaScript is called number. Now an example of the values that can be stored 
in the number data type can be 1, 200, 33.3, and 44.9. So these are some of the values that you can happily store in the number data type. Now to demonstrate, let me create a new folder here. Okay, so I will just go to my Visual Studio code. I'll say new folder and I'll call the new folder as built-in types. I'll close all the files. Here, I'll create a new file. I'll call that as index.html. And I'll add one more file here. I'll call that as main.js. Now, within index.html, I'll generate some boilerplate code for HTML. So I'll just type in exclamation and I'll press enter and you will see a boilerplate code for HTML has been generated. Okay. I'll say JavaScript crash course. And here, sorry, not here. I'll go here and I'll say script src. I'll call main.js and I'll close the tag. Fair enough. I'll hit save. Now I was able to get this boilerplate code generated automatically. If it doesn't work for you, like here are some of the extensions that I have installed already. Okay, so you can see, so this is a PyLance extension. Okay, so I don't think it, this needs any extension. You can just try it out because I don't have any specific extension for HTML. So I have one for Python, PyLance, Live Server, Jupyter, and Django. So there's nothing HTML specific. It should work for you. Fair enough, I'll just collapse this and I'll go to main.js and I'll collapse this as well. Okay, so now in our JavaScript file, I'll say a is equal to 10. And I'll say console.log, okay. I'll print in type of a. And I'll open index.html with the live server. Okay, and I'll go to the console from here. Fair enough. So you are seeing an output, okay, which says number. And this is what we have printed right now from our code. All right. Now, this is a special keyword that exists in JavaScript that allows you to get the type of any object or a variable. Now, what you can do is you can override this whole number. So we have assigned a whole number to this variable A, okay? I missed one keyword, I missed let over here, okay? So we have assigned a whole number to this variable over here. But what you can do is you can even override the whole number and assign it a floating point value. So I'll just copy this and I will paste it over here. I will say 12.5 and I'll save. The moment you save, you should see number being printed on the console. So which means that whole numbers and floating point numbers can also be assigned to the number type, all right? Now let's talk about how can we represent floating point numbers with decimal values. To have values with decimals, you will have to make sure that there is at least one digit except zero. Like for example, if you have 12, okay? So let me, let me copy this, okay? I'll go here and I'll say 12.00 and I'll just print the type of A over here. And let me hit save. So if you have 
12.02 times you have two decimal places but this will be printed like 12 and there are no decimal places as you can see on the screen okay now to get the decimal values printed you need to have at least a single digit after the point so let's say if i have 12.05 and if i hit save you will see 12.05 being printed onto the console so this is something that you are supposed to know now let me talk about the size of the number that can be stored in this kind of data type so i'll say size and we'll say console so we'll say console.log and we'll say number dot so you can see some inbuilt properties are there so i'll select max value first okay and i'll hit save so you can see a max value being printed over here and this value represents the highest value that you can store in the number type okay so if you hover on this okay max value you can see this pop up here and it says the largest number can be represented in javascript can be represented in javascript equals to approximately this number okay now what is this number so i have this number existing on my notepad so you can see this number is over here okay this is a very large number and this is what you can represent it with okay so this is a real number and i can't count it how many zeros it has but yeah this is what it is now let us check the minimum value that you can store so i'll just duplicate this line and i'll just replace it with min value and i'll hit save so the min value is this okay which you can even get if you hover on this okay and this value is printed over here so i have this value here so after decimals you have so many zeros okay this is a very small number okay so this is the min and the max value that you can store in the number type we have a couple of more types okay which i would like to show to you so i'll say console dot log okay and i'll say 10 pi 0 if i hit save you will see infinity being printed so this is also one of the type that exists and we are seeing infinity as the output because division with zero would usually result in infinity now one more type is not a number any n so if i select this and if i put this in a single quote okay and if i hit save okay so it it is giving me infinity as the output again so if you divide 10 in quote by 0 this would give infinity as well okay but let's say if i duplicate this and instead of number i change this to a character so a b c and if i hit save so now you will see n n as the output and n n means not a number okay so since it's a string with which division is being carried out and hence the result is not a number so any n does not have a value that is what it means so i'll stop this video here we haven't done much with numbers so far we will be performing arithmetic calculations and operations on various types in the upcoming videos when we look at expressions so that's about this class guys i hope you guys have a fair clarity on the number type and i hope you guys enjoyed this lecture and found it valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to talk 
about how JavaScript is dynamically typed programming language. So in the previous videos, I have mentioned that JavaScript is a dynamically typed programming language, which means that variables in JavaScript are not associated with any type, but they are associated with the type depending on the value that is assigned to them. So let me show you an example of what I mean over here. So in my project, I'll say a is equal to 10 and I'll print the type of A. If I save, you will see number being printed over here. Now let me change the type of A over here. So I'll change this to a string and I'll say I love JavaScript. Now the moment I hit save, you will see string being printed. Okay. And the reason is initially we were storing a number type and hence the type of A was a number. The moment we changed the value to a string, the type of A became a string. This is important since if you are coming from programming languages like Java and C sharp, there you have variables that are associated with a data type and type is what determines the kind of variable that is stored. This is not the case with JavaScript. JavaScript is far more flexible and allows developers to store values depending on the needs. So this is the dynamically typed behavior of JavaScript. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to talk about expressions in JavaScript. By the end of this lecture, you will have a complete clarity on this topic. And we would have even created a few expressions using JavaScript. So let's get started. So in JavaScript, an expression is anything that can be evaluated to give a single value. So I would request you all to create a new folder here. So I'll just collapse everything. I'll right click over here. I'll create a new folder and I'll call it expressions. And I'll copy this index.html file from here from the built-in types and I'll paste it here under expressions. So I'll create a new file first. I'll say index.html and I'll paste it here. Okay. And then I'll create a new file called main.js. Fair enough. So we have this file open. Now I'll just open this with the live server. Okay. And I'll close this one. Okay. Now to save time, what I would request you is to download the attached file as the resources in this lecture. And I have it downloaded already. It's expressions.js and open it with notepad. So this is a code that we have. I'll just copy this code and I'll paste it here. Okay, fine. So I have the code here. Now let's examine the code here. Okay, I'll just expand this a bit so that we have a better visibility. So in this code, we have used a few expressions. So let's have a look at some of the expressions here. On line one, so this line that I have selected, we have got expression 47 into one. So this is an expression here. This expression multiplies two values to produce the result 47. We can assign that value to a variable. And in this case, result one is the variable where the value is being assigned. On the next line, the line number two, 
we have got another expression this time the expression consists of three addition operations and also produces the value 25 okay and the result of this is assigned to a variable again called result 2 in this case there are at least four other expressions in this code but they may not all be immediately obvious the obvious one is the expression result 1 minus result 2 so this one that i have highlighted here the result of that expression is assigned to the variable difference assigning the result of an expression to a variable is one use for them but expressions can appear in other places on this line line 4 we print out the value of result 1 result 1 is a variable and here it's being used as an expression when the code is being executed, the current value of result 1 is being evaluated and that's the value that gets printed out over here. The same is true for result 2 on line number 5 and the difference on line number 8 over here. In fact, result 1 is being used as an expression on two different places so i've just mentioned this line number four here but it's also being used as an expression on line number seven here when javascript comes to evaluate the expression result one minus result two it first has to evaluate the expression result one it does that and gets the value of 47 Next, it evaluates the expression result 2. That also gives the value as 25. Finally, the expression is evaluated to give the answer. The variable name can also be an expression and can be used anywhere that, that an expression is allowed. Okay, so let me save this file and let me show you the output over here. Okay. I'll go to console here you can see the output over here so the result is 47 first result second result is 25 and the difference is 22 fair enough so I'm expanding the code editor now okay so a variable name can also be an expression and can be used anywhere that an expression is allowed also one thing to make a note of is you can't put an expression on the left hand side of equals it has to be only on the right hand side that makes sense and you probably wouldn't try to do it just to be clear what I mean is that you can't write result 1 minus result 2 is equal to 0 okay so this is not a valid statement and doing that will give you an error okay so this is not an expression and this is something incorrect the left hand side of the assignment must be a variable the expression on the right hand side the numeric literal zero is fine so this is absolutely fine over here the problem comes when we try to assign that expression to the expression on the left hand side. I've used the term literal a few times now, so I'll explain it in case it's not clear. A literal is a constant value or a constant expression if you like. The value zero on this line is a numeric literal. When our project are first created and they print out the string hello world we, we did this right we printed a hello world string and that hello world is a string literal we have also got some five numeric literals in our code right now so we have 47 1 3 10 and 12 these are all numeric literals in our code as of now 
Okay, so back to this error. It's pretty obvious that we can't assign something to an expression, but you may still get that error in your code. Okay, so let me modify this code. So I'll say, let check result is equal to result minus result one minus result two is equal to zero. Now we can change this to double equal to and the error goes away. To explain why you need to understand Boolean variables and Boolean expressions. Now this is now a valid declaration but if you accidentally forget that there must be two equal to signs here at the end. All right. So if I delete this one, okay, you get an error again. You can see, right? So I'll undo that change here. And I will stop this video right now over here. And in the upcoming lectures, you will have a clear clarity as to what this horrible looking code means. All right. So these are Boolean expressions and we will talk about this in the upcoming lecture. So that's about this class guys. In this lecture, we understood what is a expression and how can you write expressions. We took a look at a few expressions in our code. All right. And I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to talk about Boolean expressions. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a complete clarity as to what are Boolean expressions and how do we use them. So we finished the last video with a complicated line of code that you can see highlighted on my screen. On the right hand side, we have got what's called a Boolean expression. They are really no different to numeric expressions, but because we don't normally come across them in everyday use, they can be confusing at first. For that reason, I'll start off with some simpler Boolean expressions. And for that, I will create a new folder. So I'll just collapse everything. I'll right click here. I'll create a new folder called Boolean expressions. Fair enough. Now I'll add the index and main.js file. So I'll just copy this from here. Okay. And I'll paste it over here. And within main.js, I'll just delete everything and I'll hit save. All right. And I'll launch the index.html with our live server. And I'll close the previous one. All right, so far so good. So I'll close everything else and just have this main.js open, okay? So let's start with a couple of variables and a simple Boolean expressions. So I'll say let apples is equal to 10, not 10, we'll keep it 18 and we'll say let oranges is equal to nine and I'll print I'll say console.log and I'll say apples is equal to oranges. I'll hit save. Okay, and we will see the output over here. So you can see false being printed over here. The apple has a value of 18 and orange has a value of nine. So apple is clearly not equal to the value of oranges, which is nine over here. And the Boolean expression apples is equal to equal to oranges evaluates to false, which is what's printed out. Boolean expressions are often called conditions. They are just an expression that can evaluate to either true or false. When testing equality in JavaScript, we use two equal to sign as you can see over here 
As we have seen, a single equals is used to assign values to the variable like over here. The JavaScript would get confused if single equal to was used for both the purposes, which is why we have two of them when testing something is equal to something else. We can test for a few more conditions in a Boolean expression. All right. So to check if two things are not equal to each other, we use not equal to. So let me just duplicate this line over here and I'll just paste it here and I'll change this to exclamation. So one equal to becomes exclamation here, as you can see, which is what means to not equal to. So once the program gets reloaded in the browser, you will see false being printed over here. Okay. Which means the second expression evaluates to true. Okay. Sorry, it's not false getting printed, but it's true getting printed. So we have false for the earlier expression. So we have false and then we have true and true is literally for this one over here. The exclamation mark that you see over here is to reverse the test. Here we test for not equal by using an exclamation. Think of an exclamation mark as meaning not. And we will see that being used in the other sections that are upcoming as well. The other tests are greater than, less than, greater than, equal to, less than, equal to, and so on. So I'll just expand this line and I'll copy this line of code over here. Okay. So I'll copy this line and I'll add one more condition. So I'll put this in a quote like this and I'll say, I'll add curly braces and I'll add a dollar because we want this to be as a variable here and here as well. Okay. I'll expand this to full screen so that we can type well. Okay. Oranges and I'll say greater than is apples greater than oranges. All right. So this has to go to the end. Okay. Fair enough. So what we are doing here is we are printing the value of apples. So apples is 18. So 18 is greater than nine is the value of entire expression. So this should be true. So the output should be 18 greater than nine is true. Let me show that to you. So you can see the output once you save this line over here. So 18 greater than nine is true. Fair enough. So I'll just keep this expanded for a while while we finish typing in the rest of the code. So I'll just copy this line again and I'll paste it over here. Okay. And I'll just reverse the condition like this and I'll just reverse this condition like this. Okay. I'll just paste this again here and we'll say greater than equal to over here now and this will be also greater than equal to. Okay. And I'll copy this line and we will say less than equal to this time. And this is also less than equal to. Fair enough. I'll we'll move to our browser. I'll hit save and you can see 18 greater than nine is true. 18 less than nine is false. Fair enough. 18 greater than equal to nine is true. 18 less than equal to nine is false. So these are some of the tests like greater than, less than, greater than, equal to, and less than or equal to. The results aren't surprising. 18 is greater than nine, which means it's greater than or equal to nine. And those two tests print true and the other two tests print false, which is fair enough. So these are some of the Boolean expressions that we are seeing right now. Okay. So keep in mind, 
boolean expressions are always evaluated to either true or false okay so that's about boolean expression guys i hope you guys have a fair clarity as to what boolean expressions are and how can you use them so that's about this class i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to discuss what are compound boolean expressions and by the end of this lecture you will have a complete clarity as to how can you write them and we will even see some examples of the same so let's get started so far we have seen boolean expressions that evaluate a single condition but sometimes you will need to test two or more conditions at the same time and we can do that by using boolean and or or operators okay i'll provide some examples okay and to provide some examples i'll store the prices of our fruits so we have two fruits here apples and oranges what i will be doing is i'll create two prices over here i'll say let apple price is equal to 12.6 and let orange price equal to 4.5 okay i'll hit save and make a note that we are using the decimal values for storing the prices okay and we have got right now quite a few apples in our example now let's say we want the computer to reduce the price of apples if there are more apples than oranges but we only want to do that if apples cost more than oranges now there are two conditions here so i'll write the code after all our current examples that we have written here okay so i'll go to the end and i'll press enter i'll even increase the editor space over here i'll expand it to full screen okay so i'll start writing in the code so i'll say console dot lock and i'll put two packets and i'll say reducing apple cost colon okay and i'll start with a dollar here and an open curly brace all right and i'll say apples is greater than oranges and apple price is greater than orange price and i'll put a semicolon at the end so what we are doing is we are printing the output string of this so we are saying reducing the apple cost okay and there is a boolean not boolean in fact i'll say a compound boolean expression here so we are checking if apples is greater than oranges and apple price is greater than orange price okay so to make it much more readable you can have parentheses around each boolean expression so by parentheses i mean these around brackets so the parentheses around the conditions are not needed but i think they can make compound conditions easier to read the first condition apple is greater than oranges the output from line number 13 or not line number 13 so apple greater than oranges so this line over here tells us that this is true and that is something that we have seen but we don't know if the price should be reduced until we have checked prices okay and that is where the second condition comes in this one here that will evaluate to either true or false depending on the prices of our fruit in this case it evaluates to true because apples cost more than oranges and this is something that you can see at the top apple's price is higher than oranges now we want to test if both the conditions are true 
we must have more apples than oranges and apples must cost more than oranges that's what that the ampersand operator means over here and it is read as and when you use and both the conditions on the left hand side and on the right hand side must be true for this whole condition to be evaluated as true if there were three parts to the compound condition then all three would have to be true if any one or more of them are false the entire condition will be false we know that there are more apples than oranges and they cost more so you won't be surprised when you see the output so i'll hit save here and i'll reduce the size of this window here and you can see the output here reducing the apple cost the output is true the answer is still true we'll see a difference if we reduce the number of apples on line 10 so we'll see a difference if we reduce the number of apples at the top here so if i reduce this to six let's say and if i hit save you will see the output is false now okay so for the first condition apple is greater than oranges using and both condition must be true for the whole condition to be true and clearly six greater than nine isn't true so we get false for the first condition the second test returns either true or false for the first condition so the second test returns true if either of the condition is true because the apple price is still greater than the price of oranges that condition stays true and the full expression evaluates to true there's a useful tool for working with the compound conditions and this tool is known as truth tables they are a grid with the possible values as the row and column headings and the result of using and or or inside the table so let me switch over to our powerpoint presentation to find out the result of using and with two conditions read the value at the intersection of the two values that are being ended together the next four slides show the results for each of the combinations of true and false. True and true is equal to true. True and false is equal to false. False and true is equal to false. False and false is equal to false. The or truth table works in the same way but the results are different of course to find the result of using or with two conditions read the value at the intersection of the two values that are being ORed together true or true is equal to true true or false is equal to true again false or true is equal to true false or false is equal to false again so like we saw truth tables can be a great help in making sure your logic is sound before you start trying to code the conditions so i'll stop this video here right now in this lecture we have learned about compound boolean expressions and we even took a look at the example as to how they work and we ended this lecture by taking a look at truth tables. So that's about this class, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello, guys. Welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the Boolean variables. By the end of this lecture, you will have a complete clarity as to what are Boolean variables, how can you use them, and we would have even created a few Boolean variables on our own. So let's get started. So we have seen Boolean expressions and know that they can be evaluated to give a value. 
if they can represent values it's reasonable to think that we can store those values in variables it turns out we can we can use boolean variables which are of type boolean we are going to be using conditional expressions a lot throughout the course and we will be using boolean variables in this video we'll look at what they are they are quite simple they can store the values true or false that is it those are the two values that the boolean variable can hold we can also use them in place of a boolean expression just like we can use numeric variables in place of an expression as we saw earlier the definition of an expression includes the value of a variable okay let's use our boolean expressions project itself which we have created and i have that open right now here so this is the boolean expression folder and what i will do is i will delete a few lines of code but leave the variables so that we have something to work with so i'll just delete this line of code we have left the variables as it is okay now i'll add a couple of boolean variables and then we'll give them the values so i'll press enter i'll say let more apples is equal to apples greater than oranges and then we can have let apples are more dearer apples are error is equal to apple price greater than orange price okay so we have created two boolean variables more apples and apples are dearer now what we can do is we will just print the output so i'll go to the end of this line and i'll add couple of enters and i'll say console dot log here and i'll say we have more apples and i'll say dollar apples are sorry not all apples are dearer i'll say more apples that's variable and i'll add a semicolon here okay I'll copy this line, I'll duplicate it here, okay? And I'll just expand this a bit and I'll say apples are dearer. So I've used parentheses around the conditions here as you can see. But these are not necessary. I can even add it over here. So on line six and seven, the ones highlighted, we have parentheses around the conditions, but they are not necessary, but can make the code easier to read. And now if I save the file, you can see we have more apples, we get false. Apples are dearer, we get true. So apples are more dearer than oranges because their price is high. Now these boolean variables can be used in our earlier conditions to decide whether to reduce the price of apples or not. So I'm going to copy this again. Okay, I'll paste it here. And I'll say reducing apple cost. And here I'll say more apples and apples are dearer. And here I'll say, so I'll copy this and I'll say more apples or apples are dear. Fair enough. Okay. I'll hit save and you can see the output over here. So here we get the same results as the last time, reducing the apple cost, false, reducing the apple cost, true. Okay, 
So what we have done is we have used Boolean variables in our earlier conditions to decide whether to reduce the price of apples or not. Now, what we can even do is we can even assign the result of these conditions. So this condition and this condition to variables as well. So let me show that to you as well. So I'll just comment this line here. So I'll just select this block of code and I'll go to the next line here and I'll say let more apples and dearer more apples and apples are dearer okay and I can add one more variable I can say more apples or dearer and I can say more apples or apples are dearer And I can just copy this line here, this entire line, okay. And I can paste over here, reducing the apple cost. And I can replace this with the variable, I can say. And I can replace this with the variable, okay. I can say more apples and dearer. And I can copy this line again, I can paste it here. And I can say more apples or so I can say more apples or dear so far so good I can hit save and you can see the same output reflecting over here so this works well and it gives the same result okay that's all I wanted to say about boolean variables we'll be using them a lot so you will get to see real examples of when they can be useful. There is only one oddity that I would like to point out before stopping this video. Whenever we have printed out the values of conditional expressions or Boolean variables, we got true or false with the lowercase letter. The Boolean literals are all lowercase as well okay so if you try to type in this code here so if i say let true value is equal to true and let false value is equal to false okay and if you hit save you will get an error okay and the error might not be highlighted in Visual Studio Code ID, but if you save the file and if you see the output on the console, you may get uncaught reference error. True is not defined. Okay. Now this error goes away if you replace them with the lowercase letter. Okay. And if I say save, the error goes away. All right. So far, so good. So that's about this class guys. In this lecture, we understood what are Boolean variables. We created a few Boolean variables and we learned how we can use them in our code. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the booleans in Hammer Bitcoin project. So by the end of this lecture, you will have a complete understanding as to how booleans are used in a real program. So that's the objective of this lecture. So now that we know what booleans are, let's take a look at some real uses for them. So I'll close this file for now and I'll open up the Hammer Bitcoin project and I'll click on bitcoinminer.js and I'll collapse this. So we'll scroll up. Now, if you start scrolling from the top in the Hammer Bitcoin project on line number 19, which I have highlighted here within Bitcoin Miner class, you will see we have 
a boolean declared now this variable still in office has a boolean value and it keeps the track of whether the player has been fired or not now if you scroll down further from line number 47 here to if you keep scrolling line number 72 so this part that i have selected here this entire part is the if statement we will be looking at if statements in the later section of this course but basically the code in the block will keep on executing as long as the condition remains true and the condition here is this now there are two parts to the condition the first part is that the year must be less than equal to 10 if that's true so we haven't gone beyond 10 years and then the next part will be checked is the player still in office when the code first checks the condition still in office will be true it was initialized to true early on like you saw in the early part of the code here and year is initialized to one so if you scroll up at the top again you will see year is one which means both the part of the condition will be true in the first go we know that compound boolean expression true and true evaluates to true which means we will start executing the code within the if statement and it also confirms that this if statement will be executed at least once because by default these two conditions are true any which ways because there are two parts to the condition there are two things that can happen to make it evaluate to false and if you scroll down the first thing is on this line so on line number 60 to 62 now if more than 45 percent of the employees staff still in office will be set to false you can check that yourself and you can run the program and enter zero amount to pay for employees it doesn't matter what values you enter for other questions but if you enter zero for all then the results will be employees are starving and the condition is evaluated as false so let me show that to you so i'll open this with live server and i put any value here and i'll keep this to zero okay so this third one will be zero and i'll say next turn and you can see 100 of your team member starved so all the employees have starved okay and that is not good okay so our final rating is terrible okay and we are out so that's that's what it means so that happened because of this condition over here now at the bottom we get the final score being printed out over here okay and that is the result of print final score method over here and it is being called here on this line number 73 and not surprisingly we haven't done very well so this statement print final score is outside the if statement if you see so the if statement ends on line 72 okay you can see it ends on line 72 and if the condition of if statement is false then these lines are executed and since this was executed it proves that the condition was not evaluated again because the compound condition at the top here was evaluated to false okay now let's assume that we don't starve our employees and manage to keep going for full 10 rounds so if you scroll down at the bottom you have this statement here wherein we are increasing the value of year by one so each time the control enters this if loop or this if loop is executed the last thing it does is increase the year and just before closing the if statement over here so it increases the year here 
Eventually, the year will be 11 and the first part of the condition on line 47 here will be evaluated to false. When that happens, the code inside this if statement is not executed. But instead, the execution continues at line number 73 over here. And these are executed. In this fairly short method, so this method, so the entire code is part of the play method. And this is a very short method, like from line number 42, sorry, 44 to 75 over here. It's very short. And in this fairly short method, we have got Boolean assignments and Boolean expressions as well. Okay. I'll go through the Boolean expressions later on and then set you a challenge to find all the other Boolean expressions in the rest of the code. Okay. So there is a Boolean declaration here at line 19, like we discussed. The variable still in office is declared and assigned the value true. So there is a Boolean assignment on that line. Technically, the Boolean literal true is an expression. So you can count that as one of the Boolean expressions. If you scroll down around line 47 here, we have got a compound Boolean expression. Okay. And that's made up of two parts, two other Boolean expressions. So we could count that as three expressions in total. That is the case year less than equal to 10 has to be evaluated before the complete expression can be. So you will find that most programmers won't be so pedantic and will refer to the entire expression as a single Boolean expression. Okay, moving on. There's another Boolean expression. If you scroll down here on line number 60, the method count starved employees returns the percentage of employees who starved. And that's then tested to see if it's greater than or equal to 45. If it is, the assignment on line number 61 is performed. And that's then tested to see if it's greater than or equal to 45. If it is, the assignment on line number 61 is executed and the assignment is performed, okay? The literal false here, this literal here, also counts as a Boolean expression. So that's either our fourth or sixth Boolean expression, depending on how pedantic you want to be. Okay, so time for the challenge. Now, the challenge is read the code carefully. So read through this entire code for Bitcoin miner carefully and identify the Boolean expressions in the remainder of the code. I know that a lot of this code will look like gibberish, but have a go. I think you'll be surprised at how many you will manage to find even without understanding all the code. As you work through this course, all this code will start to make sense. You'll find that you already understand more of it than you did when you started. Of course, you will find a lot of it confusing. Remember that it's normal to be confused. I'll go through the code in the next video and point out where all those Boolean expressions are hiding. And if I miss any, you can mock me in the Q&A section. So that's about this class, guys. I hope you guys have a fair clarity as to how Boolean variables and expressions are used in a real world program. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the solution to Boolean expression challenge. So how did you get on? Did you manage to find the Boolean expressions as mentioned in the challenge? If not, don't worry, we'll go through the solution right now. Okay, so I'll scroll up the file over here. And I'm going to count the compound Boolean expressions as single expressions. So let's go through them and count them. 
we start off with a count of four because we have already identified the ones in and before the play method. So I'll scroll down a bit. Don't worry if you didn't count them again. The challenge was to find the ones in the remainder of the code. So if you scroll down, the next Boolean expression is here where the code checks to see if any of the employees were the victim of the market crash. And it's done to print out a output message. And that same method, so the print summary method, does another check on line number 92. And we have a Boolean expression over here. Here, it's checking if any money was stolen by hackers. If you scroll down a bit, here on line 117, there's a test to see if player attempts to buy more computers than they can afford. If the cost is greater than the cash available, we go around until they enter an amount that they can afford. If you scroll down a bit further, on line number 152 here, you can see one more Boolean expression. This time the code checks that they are not trying to sell more computers than they actually have. And if you scroll down further, similar thing is done on line number 174, where you can't pay the employees more than you have. And this loop is similar to the one when buying computers. Now, if you scroll down, you have maintain computers method, and we have three Boolean expressions in maintain computer method, one on line 196, then 199, and 202. There's a normal check that players have enough money on line number 196. The code also makes sure that the player doesn't spend too much on the maintenance. It only costs two Bitcoin to maintain each computer and the condition on line 199 checks this. It also makes sure that there are enough employees to carry out the work. Each employee can only maintain 10 computers. At two Bitcoin per computer, the amount shouldn't be greater than 20 times the number of employees. And you can see that over here on line 202. If you scroll down further, you have line 222 where a random number is tested to see if it's less than 0.15 or 15%. The game has a 15% chance of a market crash. And this is a code that checks that. If you scroll down further, in count starved employees method, on line 241, the code checks that all employees have been paid. If not enough money was given to the employees, it calculates the percentage of employees who starved. If you scroll down further, on line 264, you have another Boolean expression and this is within count new hires method. And it also checks the number of starved employees. So if the player did starve anyone, they don't get any new employees for that year. Would you go to work for someone who didn't pay all their employees? No, right? So that is what this checks for. And there's a 40% chance of being hacked and that's handled here down on line number 292 in the check for hackers method. Then if you scroll down further, you have print final score method that has four Boolean expressions to decide what kind of rating to give the player. And they are on line 321 here. Then if you scroll down a bit, you have one on line 338. 
Then if you further scroll down, you have one on line 342. And then on line 356. So these are the Boolean expressions within this method. If you scroll down further, the Boolean literal on line 396, true, so this literal true, also counts as an expression. The same on line 419 here in get yes or no method. There is also a Boolean expression on each line from line 422 to line 425. So this is one Boolean expression wherein we are evaluating this. Then you have this Boolean expression, then this one, and then this one. Don't feel bad if line 422 and 424 did not uh, seem obvious and you missed it. That's perfectly fine. You may have noticed that the if keyword is always followed by a Boolean expression so that they may have given it away. Okay, so I make that 27 including the original 4. 23 if you don't count them. That's a lot of Boolean expressions in only about let's say 500 lines of code. As you can see, they are an important part of programming. Round about now, you are probably about to go to straight Q&A section to mock me. And I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I could not resist. I deliberately skipped three of them. So if you scroll up, so I'll go somewhere here. Yes, so on line 192, Okay, there's a Boolean expression in the while loop. Have good answer is a Boolean variable. And the while loop uses not the exclamation mark to keep looping if we don't have a good answer. As long as have good answer is false, in other words. And on line, if you scroll down to not six, here, this line have good answer is assigned the value true. So that also counts as a Boolean expression. The initialization, if you scroll up on line 190, also counts as a Boolean expression. So that's another three taking the total to 26 or 30 with the original four. So I hope you have enjoyed the challenge. Were you surprised at how many you could found in code that still probably doesn't make a lot of sense? Even if you didn't find many of them, reading through the code carefully is a great practice. As you work through the next videos, you will find that you picked up all sorts of things just by reading this code. We have already covered a lot of basics of JavaScript types. In this section, we will finish the section by looking at classes and object and we'll be covering them in detail later on. Okay. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys have a fair clarity on this challenge now and the importance of Boolean expressions. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss about classes and object. So let's get started. In the next few videos, we are going to take a brief look at what classes and objects are. And this video will be an introduction for the same. So what are classes and objects? These are fundamental building blocks of an object oriented program. And they are something we will be looking at in a far more detail later on. Because JavaScript is an object oriented programming language, we are going to be a bit limited in what we can do if we don't understand what objects and classes are. So don't think of this video as a complete discussion of classes and objects. There will still be a lot to learn, but it's going to get us started. So what we will do is I'll close 
this Bitcoin miner file and I'll go to Eliza code. So here is the Eliza folder that I have and I'll take a look at main.js. So we open main.js and if you take a look at this class, sorry, if you take a look at this file, not class, you will see that here in main.js, we are referring to a class called doctor, okay? And this is something that we are getting from doctor.js. So if you scroll up at the top, okay, here you have your class doctor. Now, if you scroll down into this class, you will notice you have functions like intro. This is a method called intro. This is another method, make response and so on. So if you are coming here after learning programming languages like Java and C sharp, their all method appear to be in a class. It's not just methods either. All the variable have to appear inside a class or inside a method of a class. But that's not the case with JavaScript. So in JavaScript, you can have methods outside the class as well. Same goes for variables as well. If you navigate to the main.js, you will notice here we don't have any class defined, but we have defined and used variables. So you have some constants here, you have an object here and so on. Since JavaScript is an object oriented programming language, part of the power of object oriented programming comes from creating your own classes that focus on one particular thing. An example of a class that focuses on just one thing is the doctor class. So here you have this doctor class that just focuses on one thing. It focuses on understanding user inputs and giving responses to give illusion that it's understanding what user is typing. In main.js, we are using doctor class. So we have created an instance of the doctor class here. And we are using this doctor class to call its function intro. So here, if you go set intro, we are calling intro function over here. Okay. And if you long press command, so if you long press command and hover on this. So this is a function or a method that we are referring to from the doctor class. Okay. And this is what is defined here in doctor.js, as you can see. So I didn't explain what an instance is. So it's time to do that in the upcoming lectures. So that's about this class guys. In this lecture, we understood what are classes and objects and how we have used them in our ELISA program. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss about class instances. So to start with, I will close the doctor.js file and I'll open the project sidebar and we will be creating a new folder here. I'll say classes intro. Okay. Now it's a common practice to put your classes in their own file. That can be a good way to organize your code, especially if the class becomes quite large. There is no requirement to do that in JavaScript. Although I wouldn't recommend having huge files, you can put as many classes as you want in a single file. I would normally use separate files, but for this simple example, I'm going to create a new class in our car.js file. So what I will do is I will first create index.html. Okay. 
and I'll probably copy some code from here, the built-in project, and I'll paste it over here. All right, so I think it worked. And instead of car.js, I'll stick to main.js, okay? So I'll name the file as main.js. Okay, here. And I'll create a class to model some of the behavior of the car. So I'll say class car, okay? And I will press enter. I'll say accelerate. So this is a method that I'm defining now, okay? And I'll say console.log. I'll say you are going faster. Okay, I'll shorten this. Then I'll use one more method over here called break. And this will print you are going slower, okay? Now, this is a class car that we have created and this one has two methods, accelerate and brake. Note that the car class starts with a capital C here and our two methods don't start with the capital letter, okay? So we have brake and accelerate that don't start with the capital letter. We have already discussed the primitive or built-in types and we have just created a new type, a car type. Using this type, we can declare the variables of type car. So I'll create a variable. I'll say, let my car new car. So this is a variable of the type car. With primitive types, we could just assign a value to them when declaring a variable. We can't do that with user-defined types such as car. Instead, we have to tell JavaScript to create a new instance of the class, okay? So what we have done is we have created a new instance of the class car using the new keyword. Think of that as telling JavaScript to create a new instance of the car class here and assign a reference to that instance to the my car variable. We can create as many instances of car as we need, okay? So I can even create one more instance of the car here, okay? But the name has to be different, so I can say another car, okay? Now we have got two car instances or two car variables. If you want to relate this to the earlier discussion of primitive types, it's largely the same thing, but there are slight differences as we'll be seeing. So let's talk about a bit of terminology now. My car and another car are instances of the car class. You can say that they are the objects of the type car. Both ways of saying it mean the same thing. An instance of the class is an object whose type is the class. Our car class is a bit basic and we can call the methods to get the cars to do something. So I can say over here, so my car dot accelerate and another car dot brake. So you can hit save and you can minimize this a bit. And I'll open this index.html with live server and we will see the output here. So you can see one car is going faster and one car is going slower. We don't have any idea how fast they each are going because car class doesn't have any way to record the speed. 
and we can change that in the upcoming videos when we take a look at fields. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys have a fair clarity as to what are classes and the instances. And in fact, in this lecture, we even created our own custom class car where we modeled the behavior of a real car in the real world. And we created a couple of instances of the car class. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the class members and fields. By the end of this lecture, you will have a complete clarity as to what they are and why do we need them. In fact, we will even go ahead and define them in our class car program. So let's get started. So I'll introduce another bit of terminology now called members. Classes can have several different kinds of members. We will be dealing with two kinds to start with and we have already seen one of those before. So methods are members of the class. Another kind of member is called a field. Methods are members that perform action and fields are members that store state. Now, what is a state? So state is a value that represent some aspect of each class instance. It would be helpful in our example if our cars kept a track of how fast they were going. And that's the sort of information that a field is used for. So we will declare a field here. Okay, so I'll say speed is equal to zero. And I'll add a semicolon, I'll hit save. Now we declare a field in the similar way to a variable. However, notice that we are not using the let keyword here. If you use let keyword over here, you get an error. Okay, we have now declared a field called speed, which we initialize to zero. When our cars are created, they start off not moving. That's a sensible default value. Trying to get into a moving vehicle will probably end in tears. A field is available in all the class methods. That means we can increase the speed in the accelerate method and decrease the speed in the brake method. So what I will do is I will increase the speed here in accelerate method. I'll say this dot speed plus plus and I can decrease the speed here. So I can say this dot speed minus minus. Okay. So we haven't looked at many arithmetic operators yet. Now speed plus plus on line number four just adds one to the current value of the speed. And similarly, speed minus minus takes away one from the current value. So these are the types of arithmetic operators. Don't worry if you don't know them. Okay. Speed plus plus is equivalent to speed is equal to speed plus one. And speed minus minus is equivalent to speed is equal to speed minus one. Now you can probably spot a potential problem already. If we keep on braking, our car's speed is going to become negative. That's obviously not right. We won't deal with that situation here. This is a basic introduction to classes and you will be able to fix the problem later in the course. Okay, so I'll add some more calls to the accelerate and brake methods in our program. So I'll duplicate this line four times here and I'll add here as well. Okay, I'll move this down 
and I'll, I'll say my car dot break fair enough so I'll hit save and we can see the output over here okay you are going faster you are going slower okay so there's a problem so we have increased so it's not a problem but it's an enhancement that you can do so you're not printing speed over here okay so we can print you are going and i'll add a variable here okay i'll say this dot speed okay and i'll change this to backticks and i'll remove this you're going at the speed kilometers per hour fair enough now i'll copy this and i'll paste it in the break method as well so i'll copy and i'll paste it here there you go and now we can see the output you're going at one two three four three four because we break over here okay and then four again and you can see minus one kilometers per hour okay so after running the program just make sure it works as we expect each time we call the accelerate method of my car object it goes faster when we call the brake it slows down when we call the brake method of another car it starts going backwards not good as i mentioned however it does demonstrate a very important point each instance of car has its own speed value a speed field belongs to the instance of the class changing my car speed does not affect the speed of another car and vice versa as you can see here on the output console in fact that is why we create instances a number wouldn't be of much use here if every car had the same value and the same is true for our user defined types we can create a load of car objects and have them all going at different speeds at the moment we can't tell which cars speeding up and which one is slowing down by looking at the console or the output here it would be useful to give our cars names if we do that we would want each car to have a different name that means we can't initialize the name field at the time we declare it to handle situations like that we have something called as constructors so we will take a look at this concepts in the upcoming video but that's about this class guys in this lecture we understood how can you add fields into the class okay we were introduced to a new terminology of the class members wherein we learned that fields and methods are both members of the class and we in fact implemented or added a field called speed and we learned that every instance of the car class has its own value of speed so i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to discuss class constructors and by the end of this lecture you will have a complete clarity as to what are constructors and how can you define one yourself so let's get started we have seen how to use the new keyword to create a new instance of a class our class car has a field called speed that we initialize to zero there's another way to initialize class fields and that's to use a constructor our car class doesn't have a constructor at the moment and that's fine 
JavaScript classes don't have to define a constructor compulsorily. Often they will. So let's see what a constructor is and how can they be useful. A constructor is just a method defined using the name constructor. Programming languages like Java and C Sharp have constructors defined with the same name as that of class. Okay, so I'll create a constructor here and I'll say constructor have a value here. Okay, so that's a basic constructor, but it doesn't do anything. One thing we could do in our constructor is to initialize a field. Our cars don't have names as of now, and it's very hard to tell which car was speeding up, which car was slowing down and so on. We can fix that by giving the car class a name field and providing a name when we create each instance. So we can say this dot name is equal to name. So this name is the name that is coming as a parameter and this dot name is the field of the car class. When we create a new car, this constructor will be called automatically. You don't need to call it explicitly. We pass in a string and that string will be used to initialize the name field. Our accelerate and break methods can print that name so that we can tell which car is speeding up or slowing down. So what I will do here is I will add a variable here and I'll say this dot name okay is going so I'll add is keyword here and I'll copy this and I'll paste it here and I'll hit save. If we save the file and refresh the page you will see that undefined is being printed because the constructor expects an argument which we haven't passed yet. So this is the argument that we have. So we need to give our class names, sorry, cars names. So what I will do is I'll call this car as Ferrari and this one as the Batmobile. So I'll say Batmobile and I'll hit save. The moment you hit save, you will see the output now includes the value of name field over here. So that's the constructor at a very basic level. A constructor is a method that's called automatically when you create new instances of a class. The code in a constructor can be far more complex than our simple example, but this shows the basic of using a constructor. We will learn more about this a bit later when we look at classes in far more detail. There's one more thing to cover in the brief introduction to classes, okay, which we will be discussing in the later lectures, okay. So that's about this class, guys. I hope you guys have a fair clarity as to what are constructors and why do they exist. And I hope you have a little bit of practice since we actually created one constructor on our own. So that's about this class. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to talk about public and private members. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a complete clarity as to how you can make class members as private and how can you have public members as well. We will also be discussing why would you want to have private and public members. So I'll start with the public members. So our accelerate and break methods are public members. The reason they are marked as public is because we want to use them in the code 
that's not the part of the class. Often the easiest way to see how something works is to break it. So let's break our code and I'll do that by making the accelerate method as private. Now the question is, how do you make it private? To make private, we will have to prefix it with a hash. So I'll add hash over here and I'll hit save. Now the moment we hit save, you will see this error over here. And this error we are getting on line 21 here when we are trying to use the accelerate method. Now private members aren't available from outside the class they are declared in. To see why that might be useful, I'll add another method to our car class. So looking at line number 10, so this line here and the line 15. So they both are identical. So rather than duplicating the code, we can put it into its own method I'll also fix my errors. Okay, so I'll just fix this. And I was saying that rather than duplicating line 10 and 15, we will add it into its own method. So I'll create a method show speed. And, and I'll paste this. Okay, now we can call this method from each of the other method. Okay, so I can say this dot show speed and I'll copy this. Okay, and I'll paste it here as well. Okay, if we want to show the speed in miles per hour rather than kilometers, we now only have to make the change in one place. Okay. So as opposed to the earlier one, wherein we had to make change at multiple places, we'll now make change at one place. We'll say miles per hour and we are done. So you can see the program is working as expected. Okay. Now let us make the show speed method as private. I'll make it private by adding a hash symbol and we get an error. So the error is show speed is not a function, which is perfectly fine. Okay. So I'll have to add hash over here as well. Okay. I add that and I hit save and you can see program working again. Okay. We have got a private method show speed that can only be used inside the car class. Now you could argue that it should be public. After all, it's a useful function to have available outside the class. So that's a decision that you can make when designing your classes. If a member, particularly methods, are going to be useful in the other parts of the program, then it makes sense to mark them as public. I didn't want to leave you with the impression that methods are always public and fields are always private, which is why I marked show speed as private. Okay, so that's the end of this lecture and also the end of this section. Okay, so I hope you guys enjoyed this class and I hope you guys have a fair clarity as to what are public and private members. And we also understood this concept with the help of hands-on examples. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to summarize this entire section. So in this section, we have looked at the built-in primitive types available in JavaScript. We learned how you can use the primitive types in our programs. 
Number type can be used to store whole numbers and floating point values. We also learnt about numeric expressions and how to recognize them. We discussed Boolean expressions and variables with some simple examples. We also did a challenge to spot Boolean expressions in our Hammer Bitcoin program. And we also learned how can you use AND OR when working with the compound Boolean expressions. Then later on, we took a brief look at classes, objects, and class instances. We also discussed about fields and the information that can be stored in them. Lastly, we covered what are public and private members and when do you use which. So that's about this class and the section guys. I hope you guys found this section very useful and valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to do an introduction to this section. In the next three sections, we are going to look at various ways that we can alter the flow of execution of our code. In all the previous examples, the code has been executed step by step. It starts at the top and obeys the instructions on each line until it gets to the end of the code. That may be okay for simple examples, but if we want our programs to perform more complex operations, we need to alter the flow of execution. One way to do that is to get the code to repeat. We will look at two ways to do that in this section. We can either repeat code a set number of times or we can repeat it as long as some condition is true. Another way to change the flow of execution is to test conditions. The code can then perform one action if the condition is true and do something different if it's false. We will cover how to do that in the section 6. We have seen another way to alter the flow. We have used methods in some of the examples and in section 7 we will look at them in far more detail. If all that isn't enough, we have got something extra lined up. When you have been programming for a while, you can work out what code will do just by reading it. That takes time and practice. At first, it can be hard to work out what's going on. Most modern IDEs have something called as a debugger that lets you execute your code line by line, basically slowing everything down so that you can see what's happening. In this section, we are going to use the debugger for JavaScript to examine our code and see what it's doing. So that's about the introduction guys. I'll see you inside. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to talk about the JavaScript language reference. One of the things that makes computers so useful is their ability to execute millions of instructions very quickly. Rather than a human performing the same operation over and over again, we can instruct a computer to repeat a block of code. And the first way we will look at in this section is a for loop. A basic for loop in JavaScript can be used to execute a block of code a set number of times. So we will be referring to the ECMA specification here. And ECMA, in case you are not aware, so ECMA specification is a blueprint for creating a scripting language. Okay, and this is a URL. 
So I'll start by having a look at the ECMA specification and implementers of JavaScript follow this specification. So you can view this in the HTML and even download the PDF. Okay. So another place to know about JavaScript is maintained one by Mozilla. So here you can see this URL developers.mozilla.org. And this is widely popular and can be used for a quick reference. Okay. So this ECMA URL, so ECMA specification can be a bit overwhelming if you are just beginning to code, but this URL, like the one maintained by Mozilla should be a bit developer friendly. Okay. And this is widely popular and can be used for a quick reference. Now, whenever you want to know about a particular JavaScript construct, documentation is a good place to start. I generally won't cover every single form of JavaScript statement in this course. And once you are comfortable with each topic that I cover, I encourage you to refer to the documentation to find more. So here in the statements and declarations, if I expand this and if I scroll down, I will see the construct for for loop. So if I click on for, you can see the for loop. And as an example, scroll down to the last code on this page. Okay. And you can scroll down. You can see, you can see different code snippets. So you can go through different kind of code snippets. And at the top, you will see the try it button here, or I should say this is a hyperlink. Okay. And you have an option to run it as well, run it this way. So don't worry about uh, this code just yet or what this strange code is doing at the moment. I'm pointing out that you will find more information by checking this documentation. We have used a for loop before in the ELIZA project to iterate through the matches and make a response which can be presented to the user. Still confused? Don't worry. This section will explain all that. Okay. This documentation is a good reference when you want to find out more and when you need to remind yourself how to use something such as the for loop on this page. So if you want to look for more, you can even use the search functionality over here. Okay. So you can just enter the keyword or the JavaScript construct that you wish to search about and you can, uh, like navigate to that construct. Also, you can play around with the sidebar a bit. So here you have different categories like functions, you have statements, expressions, and so on. So you can play around, you have a section or a group here on classes as well. All right. So you can play around with this. Okay. Let me so show you how you can search though. So you can go to search bar and let's say if I want to know more about if construct, so I'll say if you should see some auto suggest and I'll hit search. Okay. And you can see if else, if match, if range, so I can go to if else, and this is the if else statement over here. You can find out all you need to know as a reminder, how to use the various statements that we'll be covering. We are starting this section by looking at the for loop. So I will type for into the filter box over here. Okay. So I'll say for, I'll say search and we'll go to the first result here. The structure of the for statement is shown over here. And documentation explains that there are three parts, the initialization, the condition and the afterthought. So that's the JavaScript documentation and how you can use it to find more information about various JavaScript keyword. Okay. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you.
Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss about for loops. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity as to how for loop works and what goes in the definition of a for loop. So in the last video, we looked at the documentation for JavaScript and finished with the structure of a for loop. Let's see what those three parts are all about. So what I will do is in my IDE, I will create a new folder here and I'll call this folder as for loops. Okay. And I'll go to Boolean expressions and let me copy this index.html and main.js and I'll paste it over here. Okay. Now here I'll go live. So I'll run this on the server. Okay. So this is running on the server. I will inspect and I will head over to the console. Yeah. And what I will do is I will just delete everything from the main.js and I'll hit save. So far so good. So I'll start writing a simple loop that just prints the numbers from zero to four in my JavaScript file. So I'll say four and I is equal to zero. Okay. And here I'll say I less than five and I plus plus console dot log I and I'll hit save. So you can see the output here, but before that, let me discuss the structure of the for loop. So for loop starts with the keyword for and followed by these three parts over here in the parentheses. So it is followed by the parentheses. So this keyword, if you look at, you have this parentheses and you have three parts within this parentheses. Now each part is separated by a semicolon and you've probably noticed by now that semicolon is used to separate code statements. We have been putting a semicolon at the end of the lines of our code. And as you can see from this example, we don't put a semicolon before an opening curly brace like over here. So we don't have one at the end of the lines of one and three, for example. Okay, back to the parts of our for loop. So for loop consists of three parts separated by semicolons. The first part is the initializer. Okay, that's usually the declaration and initialization of a variable. And we have seen the code like let integer i is equal to zero a few times now. So this creates a new number variable called i and assigns value zero to it. After initializer, we have a condition. So this is a condition part and we have looked at Boolean expressions and this is just one of those. Here, the condition is that I is less than five. The loop will continue to go round as long as that condition is true. We have started off by setting I to zero over here. So the loop will definitely go round at least once. Zero is less than five, right? And the condition starts off true unless something happens to alter the value of I. The loop will keep going round forever. And that's the purpose of the third part of the loop over here. So in this example, this part just increments I I++ plus plus means adding one to the current value of I. Okay, so I starts off at zero over here. 
gets incremented each time around the loop, okay? And it stops when i is five or greater. In the body of the loop, we just print the value of i over here. Now run the program and if I hit save, you will get zero to four printed. Now that's a basic for loop, but it can be hard to understand what's going on at first, all right? So that's about this class guys. So in this lecture, we understood what is a for loop. How can you write a simple for loop that just prints values less than five? For example, zero to four is what we have printed over here. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to talk about the JavaScript debugger. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity as to how can you use the debugger to debug your code and also to understand what your code is actually doing. So I'll start this video by saying that I'm not a big fan of using debuggers for debugging code. If you have to use a debugger, then you don't understand what your code is doing. That may be a strange comment to start a video about debuggers, but I'm talking about fixing bugs in code when I say that. When you're learning a language, it's probably true that you don't understand what your code is doing. In that case, using a debugger to strap through the code and investigate it line by line can be a great way to understand what's happening. A debugger lets you set breakpoints in your code. When you use debugger, to execute the program, it stops when it reaches a line with a breakpoint. You can check the output and see the values of your variable and get a feel for what the program has done up to that point. If we set a breakpoint on the for loop line, we can step through the code and check the value of i each time round the loop. So now what I will do is I will head over to my browser and I'll click on these three dots and instead of console, I will head over to the sources tab. Okay. And here I'll just expand this a bit because the visibility was not good. Okay. So if you go in the sources tab, you will see the for loop folder here, along with the source code that we have loaded on this server. So here you can see index.html and the main.js, okay? So you can select the JS file here, okay? And you will see the JS file opening up over here in the side pane. Okay, and you can see the line numbers as well, one, two, and three. So you can set a breakpoint, okay, in the code here. To set a breakpoint, you have to click on the left margin all the way to the left here before the line numbers. And you have to click on the line that you want the breakpoint. And you will get a huge blue mark on the left hand margin showing which lines have a breakpoint set on them. When I click again on this blue, so you will see the breakpoint is removed. Clicking again in the margin for line one will set the breakpoint again. It also highlights the code that the breakpoint is set on. Often that will be the entire line of the code, but with things like for loop, it will only highlight the first part of the loop. 
so it's not highlighting right now but it might highlight okay in your case okay once we have set the breakpoint observe that the pause button here on the tab here okay you can see pause button on the buttons tab now we execute our program slight differently with the help of the debugger and understand what's going on to run the program in the browser refresh the web page okay so i'll hit refresh okay you can see like once you hit refresh the pause button is now resume button okay it's not pause now it's a resume button now the program runs up to the line with the breakpoint and then pauses the screen may look a bit confusing you can see we have a list of breakpoints along with the line numbers okay so here if you scroll up okay and if you scroll down you can see here we have the list of the breakpoints along with the line numbers okay we have the variables by scope like variables in the block and global variables there is currently one variable i which is under the block okay here and then global variables so you can see there is a tab for global variable as well now we are interested in the value of i which is currently like undefined it says okay and we have initialized it to zero now because the code has paused at that step i hasn't changed yet okay now over to the left hand side over here so if you scroll here you have the call stack that won't make sense until we have looked at methods later in the section so methods or functions okay so let's concentrate on this window for now over here okay and we'll also take a look at the buttons here so here we have a set of buttons which we will be using okay so if you hover on this you will see this is step over step into and step out all right now the tool tips appear when you hover on the button explain what they do you also have an option to so let me see so this is a button to pause on exceptions and also to deactivate or skip the breakpoints all right so the button that we'll be using at the moment is step over also you can notice the shortcut that appears okay when you hover on it so we'll click on that button and the code will move to the next statement to be executed okay so you can see that we are now on the condition part and i has been initialized to zero so first the variable i is created and then the initialization for the i is done okay as you can see over here now i'll use the step over button again so step over will take me to the next line okay but if you open the console over here you can see that nothing is printed yet because console.log is yet to be executed okay it's not yet executed I'll, I'll just take this down and take this one a little bit up okay so i'll press step over again so you can see zero being printed over here okay so the debugger has stopped on the next line now okay and we see the statement being executed and zero being printed here on the console also you will notice that the value of i is still zero okay now debugger has stopped at this expression i plus plus but it, it's selected right now it's highlighted okay but it hasn't been executed yet and i is still zero okay so if i step over again you will see i become one over here 
okay and the value of i has changed now all the code in the loop has been executed with i having the value 0 and now i has been incremented and we are ready to go around the loop again before i do note that initialization section in the code isn't selected that code only executes once and does not execute it again it is still highlighted because that's where the breakpoint has been set but it's not executed you can see the condition i is less than 5 the this condition here is being highlighted right now which means that the condition is being evaluated right now and if i click on step over again the condition will be evaluated because that is what is next to execute so the program is about to check if i is less than 5 if it is the loop will go round again okay now i'll click on step over again and you can see that we are now inside the loop here i is also one okay which is less than five okay and if i step over again you will see there is one more statement being printed on the console okay here zero and one you have one also being printed now so i can keep going around the loop using step over and each time we get back to line one i is incremented so it's not incremented yet but if I click step over, it will be incremented. Then the condition is tested if it's less than five. And if the value is less than five, then the code, like the program control moves inside the for block, okay? So I'll just press step over a few times, okay? So I'm on i is equal to two, i is equal to three, four. Okay, so i is four now. Now, 0, 1, 2, 3, I print 4, okay, here, 4 is printed. Now, i is incremented, so if I say step over again, i is 5 now. And now, like, this condition is about to get tested, and as you can see, i is less than 5 is now being tested. And you can see this condition, when I select, will be evaluated to false, okay. And this condition is about to get false. So if I press step over again, you will see that the debugger jumps to line number three here. Okay. It is no longer executing the for loop. Instead, it's gone to the end. Now, if I click on step over again, the program will finish. Okay. So I think it went to some internal function here okay so one second so if i okay so this is a code which is injected i believe from the live server and it's being executed on step over but that's fine we are out of our uh, main.js okay and uh, we're done executing this particular for loop because there's no more code to debug so before I finish the video, I'll explain about this resume button over here. So if you remember, pause became resume when we started debugging. With large programs, it can take forever to step through the code and go through every single line using step over button. So what you can do is instead, you can set multiple breakpoints to check the bits of the code that you are interested in so i can set another breakpoint at line number three let's say for example okay i'll resume and i'll close the execution of the program okay so i have set two breakpoints now one on line number one and one on line number three because i am interested to stop at these two points and check what's happening in my code now if i refresh the page Okay, the program reloads again. I can press step over. 
to go through every single line okay and you can see one zero one okay so you can just keep pressing step over and go through every line of code and as i said stepping line by line can quickly become tedious if the loop was going round for a thousand times you would soon get bored so resume button will continue executing the program at normal speed and stop when it hits the another breakpoint okay so when i click it it stops at line number three okay and line number three now, now when the code reaches line number three all the five values have been printed and you can see them being printed on the console window and we are ready to continue debugging again of course we don't have any more code to execute so there's nothing left to debug but in large program there would be a lot more code now one final thing notice that i doesn't appear in the window below over here so so when the code reaches the line three there is no i over here okay so i was declared in the for loop and it exists only when the for loop is being executed once the execution leaves the loop i is destroyed and is no longer available and and this is because the scope of variable i is within the for loop and not outside so that's the debugger using which you can debug your javascript code it's a very handy tool for understanding what code is doing and it won't be long before you can work out what your code will do just by reading it but while you are learning what it does the debugger can really help so i demoed the debugger in the chrome developer tools so you will not need chrome for that but even firefox and other browsers have their own debugger okay now going back to my original statement that i am not a fan of debuggers i think they can be very useful when you are learning they can also be useful debugging tool in some situations but you should definitely work on understanding code by reading it in the early days using a debugger to step through the code will help with that okay back to the code i'll click on resume again to run the run to the program end and i'll end the video here okay so you can see the output being printed over here so that's about the class guys i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to discuss a bit more on for loops so now that we have seen how to use the debugger to step through a code line by line we will have a look at the for loop in far more detail so i'll just open the visual studio code so if the code doesn't make sense right away step through it to see exactly what's happening so i'll continue this for loop project that we have created okay and i'll make some changes here so let's say if we wanted to count in the steps of two rather than one we will change the incrementing part of the loop here so we'll change this to so i'll say i is equal to i plus two okay and i'll hit save and i'll switch over to the browser here and i'll just collapse this part so you can see that we are now at the initializer of the for loop and we will step through the code okay and we'll keep the i on the values for i as we go around the loop 
Remember to set a breakpoint on line number one if you removed it because we are going to be using i is equal to i plus two instead of i plus plus. The next value of i is going to be two and the next time round it becomes four and then six. When i is six, the condition i is less than five becomes false and the loop terminates. So I'll just disable this breakpoint and I'll step through. So you can see we are here on the second line. Step through, you can see zero being printed and now we'll be executing the incrementing part. So I'll step through again. You can see I is four now, okay? So I'll step through. Okay, we'll print this. So we we'll, we saw zero. So, so far we are seeing zero, two and four being printed here. And we are now at the incrementing part. And this will increment now to, let's say six. So value of i is four. Okay. Oh, so it became 12 because I, I think selected it. Okay, so let me start again okay so sometimes it behaves weird but but yeah it's it's a good tool still to learn about debugging so we are now at two four okay and we print four then this will become six now okay so now we are now evaluating the condition okay and the condition is false and you can see that we are outside the loop now. Okay, so loop has terminated and if I press resume, the code has terminated from the execution. So if I switch over to my IDE, we can even further modify this code to count backwards, okay? So I can say, i is equal to 9 okay i is greater than 0 and then i is equal to or i is minus minus okay and i can save the file okay so the file is saved okay now we will step through the code again so i'll step through we printed 9 Okay, we will evaluate the condition. We printed eight and we printed seven and it will go on, okay? So if I select this, this part of code is, let me see what happens. Okay, so I becomes three. So if I select this, this is executed. That is the thing, okay? So two, one, and this will terminate now, all right? So we saw an output of nine, eight, seven, six, five, four was skipped because I selected the incremental part and three, two, one, okay? So this is how you can create a for loop that goes reverse, okay? Now it's time for a mini challenge okay so the challenge is to modify the for loop in such a way that it also prints the value zero so so far it's not printing the value zero it's printing till one so you have to modify it in such a way that it also prints the value zero so pause the video now and start it again when you want to see my solution and after you have tried so welcome back. I hope you gave an attempt to the challenge. Now we'll take a look at the code here. Okay. So whenever you want to change the final value of a for loop, its condition part needs to be changed here, this part. Okay. Sorry, the for loop will continue executing until i is greater than zero. The moment it becomes lesser 
then one okay it will stop so in order to change this i will add an equal to sign over here sorry so i'll add an equal to sign here okay and if you want to include zero we can change this part okay and see zero being printed so if i disable the breakpoint and if i just collapse this and if i hit save you can see zero being printed here okay now if we want to include zero we can change the condition in two ways okay so this is the first way and this is my preferred way okay as well the another way is to remove equal to and add minus one and hit save you will still see the same output and it works well because we have changed the lower bound to minus one here and it is exactly doing the same thing but i think the previous way was a bit easier to read but use whichever condition makes the most sense to you okay so that's about this class guys and that's about the for loops so i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable and i hope you have a clear sense of how for loop works and what are the different forms of for loop so i'll see you guys in the next class thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to discuss the nested for loops and by the end of this lecture you are going to have a complete clarity as to how can you write and create nested for loops in javascript so looking at the code in our for loop project here as you can see on the screen we can see that we have a for loop that contains a block of code at the moment we have got only one line of code there so this line number two here but we can put a lot more and there is no reason why you can't use another for loop in there nesting loops inside loops is very useful and we'll be looking at while loops next and you can put for loops inside while loops and vice versa we are to write a javascript code which will give output as a 10 by 10 grid with the digits 0 to 9 appearing on each row let us see an example so what i'm going to do is i'm going to comment this line here and i'm going to start writing a new for loop so i'm going to say for let and instead of i i'll create another variable called j which will be the counter here okay and then we have so we'll set this to less than equal to 9 and we have j plus plus and then we'll go here log j and we have this for loop set up so before i explain the code i'll run it to see what we get so i'll hit save okay so let me load this again on the live server it seems there is some issue with my live server the server has stopped probably so i'll go to inspect again and go to console okay so you can see over here that we have this output here so don't step through the code just yet i think it will be easier if we make another couple of changes okay so i'll just close this here so first it's a bit confusing to set the loop backwards okay so on line number one here the line that is selected the out of for loop this goes backward so i'll change that to count forward so i'll change this to i is equal to zero and i is less than equal to nine 
and we have I++. I'll hit save. Okay, this refreshes again. We are seeing some numbers being printed here. Right now, we are not seeing a 10 by 10 grid, but we are getting every number printed on a single line. And that's because console.log is adding a new line character by default to every line out there. So you can see 0 to 9 here, and then 0 to 9 again and then zero to nine again. So to solve this, we will create a variable where we will concatenate the value of J to create a row. So here I'll say let row is equal to row plus I plus. Okay, so what I've done here is I have created a new variable row and then I have concatenated the value of J into this row variable and I'm printing that over here. Okay. So I'll save this and we will see the output. Okay. So we are getting an error. So we are getting an error here because J is not defined and that's because J exists within this for loop. Okay. So I'll change this to row. Actually, we are printing row over here. I'll hit save and you can see the output. So row zero, row one, row two, row three, and so on. So run the program again and you may find that you don't need to step through the code. We can see the value of I changing for each row. So this is the value of I here, which is changing for each row, okay, here. And the value of J appears in every column. So this is the value of J for every iteration of I. Okay, so what I can do is I'll go to sources here and I'll set a breakpoint here on line number five where we are creating the row string. Okay, so if there are any other breakpoints, you can clear them unless you want to leave them in, of course but I've cleared mine or this will take too long to execute. Now, once you have set the breakpoint, we can run the program in the debugger and we will see a stop at the breakpoint. Okay. So I'll just refresh this. So you can see there is a stop at the breakpoint. I'll just expand this. Fair enough. So we are at the first iteration of the loop. And here the value of row is zero. So you can see the value of I is zero. You can see over here. Okay. And J is also zero. We'll keep pressing resume over here. Okay. And we'll press resume until the value of J is 10 and the inner loop terminates. So I'll press resume now. Okay. And we are seeing the string being created for every iteration of the loop. Okay. So you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So till eight, nine, and then we have the output printed over here. You can see the output was printed each time around the inner loop. So each time round the inner loop, J counts up to nine before the inner loop terminates. And we can see that in the pane below over here, as you execute and keep pressing the resume button. Okay. Now here the value of I becomes one and J then loops through all the values from zero to nine. Okay. So it loops through zero, one, two, three, four, now, once the inner loop has gone through all the values from zero to nine, again, the outer loop continues. And this time the I will be two. So let me show that to you. Seven, eight, eight. And now if I press resume, we exit and the value up till nine was printed. Okay. So this is what is happening. And I is now two. All right. So it keeps on going until 
the value of i is less than equal to 9 so this condition is satisfied so until this condition is satisfied we keep going and once this turns to be false we exit the loop and we and the program terminates actually because there is no more code to execute okay so i'll stop the video here right now there is still a bit more that we need to know about for loops okay we really need to understand the if else statements before we can look at things like continue and break so what i would recommend now is you can experiment with different values for these loops and use a debugger to understand what's happening before moving on all right so that's about this class guys i hope you have a fair clarity as to how you can write and create nested for loops and how do they work so i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable i shall see you guys soon thank you hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to discuss how can we use a debugger with the hammer bitcoin project and by the end of this lecture you will have a clarity as to how hammer bitcoin project works because we'll be using debugger to understand a bit of code within that project all right so what i will be doing is i will switch over so i'll just close these files and i'll open the hammer bitcoin project okay here and i'll just close this and i'll also make sure that this file is open in the browser on the server all right so here we are in hammer bitcoin project now what i will do is i will set a breakpoint all right so we will switch over to our ide here sorry not id but browser over here and i'll head over to sources game.js set intro here now here we have set a breakpoint okay and we will refresh the page okay so after refreshing you will see that the program control has stopped onto the line number three here which is the set intro call or the call to set intro function okay now this function has not been executed yet all right so so before i just start explaining this function i would also like to highlight that i have used terms like method and function okay so method now what is a method and what is a function so method is nothing but a function itself within a class okay so if a function is defined within a class okay it is usually termed as methods in object oriented programming and function is the function that we have defined here okay so i was saying that we have this set intro function defined over here okay and this is not executed yet so what i will do is i'll use the step into method here sorry step into button here since we want to step into this function okay so we go over here okay and we will go through step by step okay and you can see that uh, every line of code so you can see here so we are within this class uh, bitcoin miner now since we pressed step into a few times okay and we came here from this line 7 here okay so what we did over here is we are creating an instance of this bitcoin miner class okay and when we did a step into over here we were taken to this particular class over here okay and what we are seeing now is we are seeing what happens when you create an object so when you create an object okay you can see that we went into the class and all the variables that are defined over here the class members or the field 
they are being created and initialized one by one okay now i mentioned that we create instances of the class and that's used to create a new object and new object meaning a new instance of bitcoin miner in this case here as you can see now it's not quite same as assigning a value to one of the primitive types instead it runs some code in the class as you can see over here okay and it happens that when a new instance is created usually for a class the constructor of that class is executed but here we don't have the constructor for bitcoin miner class okay so what it did is it opened up the bitcoin miner javascript file and we will have to step through the code over here okay and while stepping through a series of class members are defined over here and those are being created and initialized okay now one thing that you will see so we have already executed a couple of lines here so we have already executed the line 3 here and the line 6 here but you are not seeing the values over here in the pane at the bottom left sorry at the bottom right now whenever a primitive variable was being created you could see the value appearing over here okay but for an instance of the class you will see this bitcoin miner so you can see this this keyword here okay and this is a variable so you can see this and its value is hammer bitcoin dot bitcoin miner okay so you can see this is the bitcoin miner class okay and this indicates that it's an instance of this class in fact the word this has a special meaning over here it refers to the current instance of a class we have just created an instance of bitcoin miner and inside the class that instance is called this okay so to see what this contains you can just expand this and you will see the two class members ogh and eo have been initialized now the moment i press step into you will see eo also being created here okay now we have quite a few variables or i should say class members here okay so we will press step into until we go to still in office which is nothing but the last variable okay now once still in office is executed you will see all the class members have been initialized over here okay and you will notice that the properties which are initialized will have a value and one without the value won't have a value and it will be set as undefined so here we have like computers maintained so if you scroll up here at the top so we don't have a value for computer price we haven't defined a value here so computer price is undefined okay same is for cash paid to employees and computers maintained all right so they don't have a value because and and the value that they have is undefined because actually we have not defined them okay now if you press step into a few times you will be back to game.js so if i press it again okay you will be back to game.js here so we are back to game.js because we have finished creating the instance over here on line 7 and remember for creating the instance some code from bitcoin miner class was executed all right now here in the bottom right pane you will have to expand the script here okay and you can see the game variable over here so this is nothing but the instance of the bitcoin miner class which we have just created so earlier 
when executing the line number seven, this would have been set to undefined, okay? Because the instance was yet to be created and it didn't have a value. But when we executed the line, the assignment part was executed and game now has a value. It's now been assigned an instance of the Bitcoin miner class. Now, if you weren't sure what I meant earlier when I said that the expression on the right has to be evaluated first, it should now make sense. Only when the new Bitcoin miner object has been created, it can be assigned to the game variable. Okay. Now, what I will do is I'll press step over a few times here. Okay. So, and I'll get the rest of the code executed until the debugger stops. Now what I need to evaluate is, so I need to evaluate the play method. So I'll disable the breakpoint here. I'll go to Bitcoin miner. I'll scroll down and I'll set a breakpoint here on line number 45. So this is the first line of the play method. Okay. Now, if you observe the HTML here, so I'll just open up the HTML and I'll scroll down. So you can see like you have a game start method when you click on next turn button and within game start. Okay. So here within game start, you call the play method. All right. So we know that it's an instance because we have just seen it being created. So we know that game is an instance, all right? But we knew before that because the convention is to start an instance variable with a lowercase letter. So game starts with a lowercase g. So we knew it's a reference to an instance rather than a class, okay? So if g would have been caps, okay, then the case would have been that game is a class and not an instance. But since we are following the naming convention, so just by knowing the naming convention, you know that this must be an instance of the object. Okay. So what I will do is I'll just go over here. I'll change some values of the sliders. and I'll hit next turn. So when we hit next turn, we are being taken to the play method over here within the Bitcoin miner class. Okay. There's one more thing I want to show you about the debugger. And that is that you can set breakpoints while debugging. So you don't have to set them all before you start in other words. So if you notice that some of the code looks interesting, you can set a breakpoint to get the debugger to pause at any point. You can also use a breakpoint to run over the code that you are not interested in, but stop when you get to something you want to debug. So for example, if I scroll down over here, so on line 73, I'm calling the final print final score method. So let's say we may want to check that print final score method, for example. So if we try to do a single step over all this code as it goes round and round the while loop. So there's a while loop over here at the top. Sorry, not the while loop, but if statement. And yeah, we have a couple of if statements. So this will take some time and we will have to be here for a long time just to reach the print final score method execution. So instead what I can do is I'll set a breakpoint here because I want to debug this method. All right. 
And once I've set a breakpoint here, I'll hit resume. All right. Now the program pauses at the second breakpoint and we can now step into this particular method. Okay. So I'll say step into and you can see we are within this particular method here and we can just keep pressing step into okay and we can like go through the entire code and we can see some output being printed over here so you can see the output has come over here and i am in the year two of my 10 year rule all right so this is how you can play around with the debugger and you can set breakpoints while executing your code or while your code is already in the debug mode. So I'm going to pause the video over here now. Okay. So what I would like you to do is you should experiment with the debugger stepping into and stepping over things until you are comfortable with using it in larger programs. All right. So that's about this class, guys. I hope you guys had fun debugging our Hammer Bitcoin project. And I hope you have an understanding as to how a few things in Hammer Bitcoin code or project works. So that's about this class, guys. I'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello, guys. Welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the for loops in our ELIZA project. And by the end of this lecture, you are going to have a clarity as to what are the different loops that are working and how are they working in the ELIZA project. So when we use debugger with ELIZA, which is something that we'll be doing in this lecture, you will also get a sense as to how that project is working. So let's get started. So, so far we have used debugger in a couple of files in our hammer Bitcoin project and the for loop project. And you should be getting comfortable with the debugger now. So let's get back to looking at for loops in a real program. So I'll just collapse this. I'll go to Eliza and I'll open main.js. Okay. So I'll just click on the Eliza.html, right click, and I'll open it with a server. So live server. Now I'll navigate to the sources tab and I'll go to main.js. Now here, if I scroll down, there is a function called bot response. Now I'll set a breakpoint over here where we are making the response. So we are calling make response method or function from here. Okay. Now what I will do is after setting the breakpoint, I will hit refresh and you will notice that the debugger has not reached the breakpoint yet. So the reason is the code is waiting for an input from the user in order to craft a bot response. So this particular function creates a bot response and bot response will be created only when we give any input. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here and I'm going to say, I need advice and I'll hit send. Now, after sending this message, you will notice that we, our code has reached the breakpoint. Okay. And you can see here, we have the Eliza instance. So here we have created an variable called Eliza. And here we have defined or we have initialized that instance variable. Okay. So if you scroll down here, you can see we have reached to the breakpoint, okay? And I will say step into, okay? 
So I'll press the step into button because we want to step into the function. So I'll go over here and you can see that we are into the doctor.js make response method in short. Okay. Now, if you scroll down over here a little bit, you will see there is one for loop. Okay. There is another and there is one more. So there are three for statements. Okay. In this method. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a breakpoint on every for loop over here. Okay. Now I'll say continue. And the debugger stops on this line 148. Okay. Now, what will happen is this code within the for loop will look for the match to the text that I have typed in. And the text I have typed in is in the variable user input here. You can see I need advice. Okay. And if you scroll up here, you can see we have two variables output and remainder. So these are just empty strings at the moment. Okay. Now let me press resume again. And this time the code stops on line number 160, which is the inner for loop. Okay. Now if you scroll down here, you can see the match variable in the pane at the bottom. And this is set to the text that matched what I typed. Okay. So I typed in, I need advice and the program has found a match with I need. All right. And if you scroll down a bit, there is a variable called rem. So here you can see there is a variable called rem. So this variable contains the remainder of the text I typed. So it has a space and followed by the advice string. Okay. So what will happen here is if you scroll down here, so the code will now go through each word in the match and see if it should be replaced by any of them. Okay. Now, if Eliza is going to respond to, I need, she might ask, why do you need? That means I must become you. And you can see the re replacements in the reflections dictionary. So if you scroll up at the top, okay. So here you will have reflections and these are all the replacements. So you can see over here, I becomes you. Okay. Now, if you scroll down here, so let me scroll down. So this particular code here works with reflections. So you can see this for loop works with reflections. Okay. And I'll scroll down here. And I'll put a breakpoint here on line 177. Okay. Or let me set it over here at line. No, I'll set it on 177. Okay. And I'll say continue again. Okay. Continue again. So after pressing continue again, I'm taken to line 177. Okay. Where we are crafting the output. Now here you can see output is nothing but an empty string. And if I press step into to execute this line, you will see the output becomes, are you sure you need percentage one? Now, after pressing step into to execute this line, the output becomes one of the random responses. Okay. We are still executing the code inside the for loop that starts. Okay. So inside the for loop that starts over here at line 148. Okay. And that is where we are inside. Okay. Now, because we have found a matching response. Okay. There is no need to go around the loop again. And there's a way to break out of the loop. And if you don't want to keep going around, there's a break statement on line 178, as you can see over here. And right now our debugger is on line 178. 
So the block of code in the loop finishes on line 178, which means break should send us to the next line after that, okay, which is over here. So I'll press step into and we go to line 182, which is outside the loop. Now, one thing that I would like to mention here is the outer loop keeps going around, checking each of the phrases that Eliza recognizes. It'll keep going around until it's checked. It has checked all the phrases, but because we used break, it also jumps out of the loop when we find a match. If we hadn't found a match, output would still be an empty string. And that bit of code on line 182, as you can see here, checks for that and uses a random response from the last item in the list. Okay, so you can see there is a list here. Okay, so this is the list responses. And there is a last item. So if you scroll down, so this is the last item in the list. Okay, and what happens is, it uses the item, any item from the last item in the list. Okay. And this is on line 124, as you can see, and all of those responses are used when Eliza hasn't recognized anything in the input. Okay. The output is currently a random entry from the matching row and it will have a percentage in it. Okay. For example, it might say, would it really help you to get percentage one followed by a question mark? And this line will replace the percentage one. Okay. So just let me scroll down. So here, this line will replace the percentage one with the remainder variable. And if you check over here, the value of remainder variable is advice. Okay. So. If you notice output is, are you sure you need percentage one? Okay. And here on this line, percentage one is replaced by advice. All right. And that is what becomes the output. So are you sure you need advice? Now to see that working, you will press resume again. Okay. And I'll press resume and you will see here in the browser, are you sure you need advice? And that is what exactly gets printed. Okay. Now Eliza appears to have understood what I typed and has come back with what looks like a suitable response. It's just pattern matching. Of course, there's no real artificial intelligence in there. Modern AI systems are usually more complex and build up databases of information as they learn more about the world. Eliza is a lot simpler and using the debugger, we are starting to understand how she works. Okay. Now what is happening is Eliza is waiting again for an input. Okay. So, what I will do is I'll stop this lecture here right now. And I hope you guys have a fair clarity as to how can you use the debugger with Eliza project. And I hope you have some clarity as to how loops in Eliza are working to help Eliza give a proper suitable response to the input. So that's about this class guys. I would recommend you all to play around a bit more with the debugger and try understanding what ha is happening and what is Eliza responding to when you type in a particular input. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys. Welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss a bit more about Eliza. So we left Eliza waiting for more input here in the browser. Okay. Now what I will do is I have kept 
all my breakpoints as it is, as you can see. I have not removed any of the breakpoints. Now I'll enter the word quit. Okay, so I'll say quit and I'll hit send. Now the moment you hit send, you will see that the debugger has reached the make response. So here the line in main.js, which is calling make response method. So I'll press step into, okay, and we will go into the make response method here. Okay. And I'll, so to speed things up, what I will do is I'll set a breakpoint here on 151. I'll disable this breakpoint. Okay. And I'll press resume. Okay. So we are here now on line 151. Okay. And this is just before the test to see if the match was found. Okay. And if the value of position isn't minus one, then the user's input contained one of the phrases which we are searching for. Okay. So now the match variable is life. Okay. As you can see, if I press continue, it's I need. Okay. Now every time you click continue, the phrase we want to match appears in the match variable. Okay. And if you scroll up and take a look at the match list here, so earlier you had life. Now you have, I need, okay. And the matches will be performed in the order that they appear and down below you have quit. Okay. So if you press continue, why don't, why can't I can, I am okay. You have to just keep pressing continue. So now going through the code, you're going through everything. Yes. Computer. Is it? It is. Can you, can I, you are, and I think we should be there near quit now. So we are here at quit now. Okay. Now there are no reflexive words in the phrase quit. So the inner loop won't achieve anything here. Okay. So this inner loop is the loop that I'm talking about over here, but it's still executed though, as you can see by stepping through it. Okay. So I'll just do step into and it will still be executed. Okay. And if you are interested as to what happens inside when one of the reflection freezes matches, you could put a breakpoint here on line 165 and check it around yourself. So this is within the if statement here. Okay. And you can press continue and you would need different input of course, to see how this behaves. So I will leave you to experiment with that. Okay. And I'll use continue now. Okay. And I'll go to line number 177 now. All right. Now we know that the response will be a random freeze. All right. From that list. Okay. So if you scroll up, you have a list of responses here. Okay. And here, if you scroll down, like there will be, so here from 122, like the line number 122 and the item that exists here. So we know that response will be from here and it will be a random freeze. Okay. Now, if you count them, if you scroll up, you will see that every, each phrase in matches list on line one, okay, has the corresponding set of responses in the responses list. Okay. And the responses list starts on 48. So line number 48 here, you can see. And the last entry that you see over here 
if you remember is for in case the phrase does not match okay and what i would do is i will step through the code and check the value of output here so the output is thank you that will be 150 okay one second so that will be 150 dollars so if you scroll up here okay you can see thank you that will be 150 dollars and have a good day all right so it does a random match from this item here okay this item in the list now because they are chosen at random i can't say which one it will be until it comes up of course okay so you might have a different response over here in case if you are debugging with me and that's perfectly fine that is how the program should behave all right and if you press resume once again you will see this response appear over here all right so i'll stop this lecture right now okay we have seen how the code loops through a set of phrases and attempts to match one of them with the part of the user's input and that's performed here so i'll just expand this again and if you scroll here or i'll just open the editor so editor would be better because uh, of the better size so i'll go over here and here you can see so we are checking if there is a match using the index of method and this is used to check if the phrase exists in the user input okay so we are converting everything to lowercase first and then we are using index of to check if there is a match in the position if there is no match we get minus one and the return of minus one means it wasn't found any other number is the position in the user input where the phrase is matched so we have also seen how the reflection list was processed here okay so here in this case this is the part that i'm talking about and there's a lot of code that still won't make sense and that's normal but you should be starting to get a feel of how this works and how a for loop can be useful for repeating blocks of code remember that you can google the keywords that you want to know more about so what you can do is start with javascript for example the search term javascript index of will tell you more about this code here so on line number 150 so if you want to know what this code is doing you can type in javascript on google followed by space and index of and you will land an article which will help you understand what's happening over here. So we will be using for loops throughout the course and you will get plenty of practice writing them. So I'll finish this video by saying that there's a big jump from understanding code to be able to write your own. Don't worry if you feel that you will never be able to write code like this, okay? Along with confusion, that feeling is also normal okay stick with it and you will be able to so that's about this class guys in this lecture we learned how for loops and the matching in eliza works and i hope you guys have a fair clarity as to how things work and how phrase matching happens in eliza to generate a suitable response for the user so i hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss while loops in JavaScript. And by the end of this lecture, you will have a clarity as to how while loops work. Okay. So I will switch over to my for loops project here. So we have used for loops over here. What I will be doing is I will create, I'll rename this file 
to main for okay and i'll create a new file called main.js main while.js okay and within index.html i'll say main while.js okay and i'll just open this with the live server here and i'll go to console all right so far so good okay so here what we are going to do is we are going to start writing our first while loop now before you do so just make sure that you have like included this javascript file that you just created within your index.html all right now let us say we have a for loop here okay so for let okay so i have written a basic for loop which just prints 0 to 5 okay so 0 to 4 in fact it goes up until the value is less than 5 so if i hit save you will see 0 to 4 being printed over here so this is how you can print value from 0 to 4 on the console using a for loop now how would you do this using a while loop okay so i'll just remove this I'll say let i is equal to zero. So as opposed to for loop with while loop, you have to first create a counter, okay? And then you, we will say while, so I'll say i less than five, and I'll say console dot log i, and I'll say i plus plus okay so with while loop what we have done is we have a declaration here the condition here and the increment part over here okay in for loop the variable is declared in the for loop statement itself and here that is not the case so whatever is part of the block is repeated as long as the condition is matched to be true and the condition is mentioned here. This is the block, okay, that you are seeing. So this is the block. And this is repeated as long as this condition is set to true, okay? Now, let me add a console.log statement here as well. So let me first run this. So if I save, you will see the same output here, okay? And I can even say console.log this is an example of while loop i hit save and you can see this is an example of while loop being printed with every iteration of the loop all right now this is how you can write a simple while loop okay now there's a challenge so at the moment the program displays the message again after each selection or each iteration so your challenge is to modify the code so that the message is printed only once okay so this message this is an example of while loop should be only printed once so give this a try okay and i will write the solution in the next lecture so that's about this class guys. I hope you guys have a fair clarity as to what are while loops and how you can define while loops yourself. And we also understood how they are different from for loops. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found this class valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the solution for the challenge that we discussed in our last lecture. So did you give the challenge an attempt? How did we get on? So were you able to modify the program 
so that the menus only printed once. If you were able to, congratulations. And if you were not able to, that's perfectly fine. We will go through the solution right now. So here is what we had in the last lecture. And looking at the code, the while loop is controlling this entire block of code here. So these three lines are being controlled by the while loop from line three to line five. Now everything in that block will be executed each time while loop goes around again. So if you don't want this message to be printed for every iteration of the while loop, we just have to move the code out of the while loop. So what we will be doing is I will cut this. Okay, I'll delete this line here. Okay, and I'll just paste the code over here. All right. And let me hit save now. So the moment I hit save, the server reloads and you see the output here onto your right hand side. So you see, this is an example of while loop and you see the number being printed over here. So this is how you can solve this challenge and the solution is to move the message out of the while loop. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys have a fair clarity as to how while loop executes a bunch of statements within its block. So that's about this class. I'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss which way is better. So when students see two different ways of doing things, a question we often get asked is which is better. For an example, you have a program where we accept a character. So we have this character user choice over here, as you can see, and we check if the user has entered the character as Q. If the user has entered Q, then we don't enter into this loop. Okay. Now, here before doing this check we are also converting this to lowercase okay so if a user presses a capital q or a smaller q like a lowercase q this condition is evaluated in the correct way now there is one alternative and that's to test both upper and lowercase without changing the user choice value so if you notice here user choice is capital Q, but then we are modifying the user choice to lowercase. So by the time we reach here on the if statement, we don't know whether user choice was initially capital Q or lowercase Q. The another approach would be this code. Okay. So here we have commented two lines of code. The first line is where we convert the user choice to lowercase and second one where we are only evaluating the user choice with the lowercase letter. So here in the if condition, we are checking for the uppercase and lowercase Q. So this is another way of doing the same thing. So which way is better? So that question doesn't really have an answer because words like better and best are subjective. It depends on what you mean by better. Unless you define what better means, you can't say which is better. So how do you decide which approach to use? So, well, in this example here, the previous one, here we are modifying the user choice. Okay. We have no idea whether the user entered the capital Q or a lowercase one. So by user entered, I mean, what was the actual or initial value of user choice? We won't have any idea because we are overriding it right now. 
that may be important later in the code but in this example we don't care because we are going to respond the same to both and their input or the value of user choice won't matter however in another application that may not be the case we may need to know whether they typed a capital or a lower case q and then in that case the other approach is clearly better so that's one disadvantage of doing it this way one advantage is that the condition here so this condition in if statement looks much more simpler than the one over here so the condition here is little bit complex but this one is very simpler so which is better so in this case it doesn't really matter because we are not using user choice value later in the code it's just used for the evaluation all right so it doesn't really matter so you can go ahead with the simpler condition over here but also this condition will also work so there are often several ways to do the same thing it's an old joke that if you ask 10 programmers to solve a problem you will get 11 different solutions so if you have to decide between two approaches making sure you understand the code can help you decide which is better in any given situation sometimes what's better in one situation won't be better in another performance can sometimes be an issue so considering how many conditions are tested or how many operations are performed can help in choosing one approach over another on that note i'll finish this video with a challenge so this for loop prints all the numbers between 0 and 100 that are divisible by 7 now percentage symbol here is a modulus operator which returns the remainder after division if remainder is 0 then 7 divides exactly into the number how many times will the loop go round and how many times is the condition tested in the loop this for loop also prints all the number between 0 and 100 that are divisible by 7 so how many times will the loop go round and how many times is a condition tested in the loop So here are two sets of code side by side. So how many times will each loop go round and how many times is the condition tested in each loop? Pause the video and continue when you have got the answer to those questions for each loop. Using your answers from the previous slide, which of the two code is better? The code on the right is simpler. which is normally a good thing if we define better as easier to read the code on the right is better the loop on the left goes round 101 times which is 101 times but the right hand loop only goes round 15 times the loop on the right also has a lot less work to do there's only one condition to test each round the left hand loop tests the same condition and also tests if i modulo 7 equals 0 that's an extra one division and one test 101 times so in terms of performance the right hand loop is better if we have written our own javascript engine and want to test that the operator modulus works which of the two bits of code is better hello guys welcome back so in this lecture we are going to discuss another form of while loop or another form of loop called do while we have seen how while loop works now we are going to take a look at another form of it it's basically the same thing as a while loop 
with an important difference that the condition is tested at the end of the loop. So we will update our existing while loop to do while. So here on line number three, we have a while keyword. Okay. And this while keyword is followed by a condition. As long as the condition evaluates to true, the body of the loop will be executed. Note that the loop may never be entered if the condition evaluates to false. Now when the condition is evaluated to false, so this condition on line three, nothing inside the loop will be executed. So we can test that by initializing I to five and hit save. Now the moment you hit save, you will see that there is no output here. The loop doesn't execute and the program terminates straight away. You just see this message here and that is because the message is outside the loop. Now in order to run the loop, we have to initialize I to something less than five so that this condition is evaluated to true. Now sometimes, and this is one of those times when we want to make sure that the loop does execute at least once. And the alternative to use is a do while loop. So we use a do keyword instead of while and move the while part to the end of the block. So I'll just remove this. I'll say do and I'll put while here. So this is the do while loop and the body of the loop is always entered. So once all the code has executed, the condition on line six is evaluated. And if this condition is evaluated to true, the control goes back to line number three and the loop runs again. Now, if the condition on line six is evaluated to false, the next line of the code is executed. And that would be the line number seven. If we had any code there, we don't have any code here. So the program will terminate. So I'll just save this. And if you save, you'll see five being printed. And that's because I is initialized to five and the condition is marked as false and hence the program terminates. So this works fine. So also one thing that you should be aware of is not all computer languages have to while loop. You have to work with just the while loop. And as we saw, you can use a while loop to get the same effect as long as you initialize the variable that's used in the condition. Do while is more readable when you want to make sure that loop goes round at least once. And in terms of their function, that's the difference between a while and a do while loop. A while loop will go round zero or more times. A do while loop will go round one or more times. So that's about this class guys. I hope you guys have a fair clarity of what is do while loop and how it works in JavaScript. So I hope you guys enjoyed this class and found it valuable. I shall see you guys soon. Thank you. Hello guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to summarize this section. So we discussed in this section, the JavaScript documentation and how it can be used to find the information about various JavaScript keywords and statements. We learned about four loops, there are three parts, the initializer, condition, and the increment. And we also discussed the purpose of each one of them. We learned how to use the JavaScript debugger in Chrome to step through your code and check what it's doing. We learned about nested for loops, how they work and when they can be useful.
We discussed more on debugging where we use the debugger to step through the hammer Bitcoin code. Setting breakpoints in larger programs helps you focus on the bits of the code that you are interested in. We use the debugger to step through the for loops in the ELIZA project to understand how the responses are generated. We learned about while loops and how it works. We discussed the idea that one bit of code is better than another and how the criteria you use are important when deciding. We discussed the difference between while loop and a do while loop. A while loop tests its condition at the start and the loop will be executed zero or more times. A do while loop tests the condition at the end, which means it always executes at least once. So that's about this lecture and this section guys. I hope you guys had a lot of learning and fun. So I'll see you guys in the next section. Thank you.